think it's Missouri. I'm from Wisconsin this week. <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin this week. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. You may be seated. What a delight to be with all of you this morning, afternoon now. Uh, spent a great deal of time with a number of you yesterday, and I was tremendously blessed by your presentations, the way you had incorporated the word into so many different categories, and uh, I could see it taking root. Pastor's mentioning the alabaster box lady. That story is so fascinating to me and suggestive in several areas. One of those is she broke the lid off the jar. She wasn't careful to unscrew the lid. It was, that worship wasn't going back in. The jar's busted. I'm emptying it all. Scripture said it started at his head and went all the way down to his feet. Uh, she broke the box. So we've come this morning, this afternoon, to just break the lid off the thing. We're just going to empty it out. Nothing's going to be held in reserve. Of course, the estimates are that that would have taken a whole year's of laborers' wages. That's a $20,000 waste. $20,000 waste, and she wasn't taking any of it home. Second thing that's suggestive in that passage is said this aroma filled the house. Her worship permeated everybody's garments, even though she gave it on Jesus. Because everybody else was close around when she worshiped, her offering permeated everybody else's clothes. And it went into every room in the house. So as someone that had been close when she was praising the Lord, they would walk down the street and folks would get a whiff of her worship off of their garments. Where you been? Well, I went to dinner yesterday, minding my own business, getting a chicken leg. This crazy woman came up. She said she just had to worship Jesus a little bit. That's what you smell on me. You smell her worship. What would happen if all of us just mingled our worship together for the Lord this afternoon? And <laughs> smell could be mixed together as adoration to the King. And then as we go about our business this week, because that kind of smell doesn't dissipate. Scripture says she did this for his burial. A week before he was buried, that smell was still there. On the garments they gambled over. They gambled over the garments and took them home, but there was still her worship permeated the fibers of those garments. All week, we're going to go home permeated with our worship from today. You see, what we do today has impact all throughout the week. This morning, I'd like to talk a little bit about being a normal Disciple, I think I have, there we go, a normal, a normal disciple. We are called not to be weird disciples or flaky disciples. We're just called to be normal disciples. We live in a world of extreme everything. Extreme sports means if you haven't busted your leg a few times, you're not really doing it right. <laughs> right? If you're a skateboarder and you haven't got the wounds to go with it, then you've not really been. If you're a snowboarder and you haven't got several months in traction, you, you just haven't been doing it right. And if we're not careful, I've heard people get together for church and say, we don't want normal church. We want extreme church. What do we got to do? Peel the paint off the wall? We have to run enough time to... Wear holes in the carpet as if our extreme behaviors are what get God's attention. So I want us to help realize, next slide please, that in many ways we're average. This is the famous bell curve. If we put our shoes from smallest to largest, most of us would be in the middle. We talk about our height. Most of us are in the middle. Talk about of our intelligence. Most of us are in the middle. There was a book written several years ago, It Takes So Little to Be Above Average, how stupid that title is, to someone a little bit of mathematic background. 
If we all tried to be above average, you know what we change? Average. I, I have found out the best way to be above average is to buy all your buddies' video games. <laughs> Let them spend all night playing Madden, whatever the season is, so that they can't function well on the job the next day, and all of a sudden your performance is through the roof. Not because you're above average, you just dropped, you dumbed down the average. All right, so when we, when we think about being a disciple, we don't want average. Next slide, please. Instead, what we want is normal. Now, here's a definition from normal that I'm using. Conformed to the standard or the common type, the usual. We want to be standard disciples. Guess who sets the definition of standard? <laughs> our rabbi does. Our teacher does. As we follow him as students, we want his norm. When I go to get oil in my car, I don't want extreme oil. I don't want above average oil. I want the right oil for my car. The engineers determined what was right. Just buying more expensive oil doesn't do the job. I want to know what the engineer said belongs in that vehicle. I don't want extreme oil. I want normal oil. As we follow Jesus as a disciple, we don't want to be extreme disciples. We want to find out from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords what's normal, what's standard do you have for us? We frequently ask the question, am I normal? This is a question that we ask frequently. Adolescence is critically a period for determining what's normal. Next slide, please. We want to wonder, am I going through, do other folks go through this? Anybody that does any form of counseling or care, you know that your major job is to help people understand they're not really weird. Lots of folks have gone through this before you do realize that women have given birth before. Like billions of times. In most of human history, there weren't doctors around. Birth isn't a medical procedure. It's a normal life procedure. Oh, I didn't say it didn't hurt like the Charles Dickens or anything like that. I, I'm just uh, saying it. It's normal. So when we ask the question, am I normal? We live in a world, next slide, here's a norm. Here's a norm. Our world wants to say, I am not normal. I don't want to be normal. I don't pretend to be normal. I am me. That's the new norm for our world. I don't want to blend in. I want to be different. No, that's being the same as everybody else. Have you ever watched a biker gang? These, 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 uh, the Harley type, you know, they all have to have their black leathers and they all have to have their ponytails and they all have to have their beard that when they're riding down the road, their beard parts in the middle and they wear a hat each year. When you see them by themselves, you say, wow, what a character, what a person that acts out their own identity. And then you see 10 of them together and you say, no, they're all conformists. You will not see a Honda motorcycle in a Harley gang. Because it's not normal. By the same token, you see a bunch of uh, Honda riders, you know, uh, in a city zipping up and down and around streets. You're not going to find a Harley rider with black leathers there. Because that's not normal. Our question is today... Are you concerned about what's average, which is determined by what everyone else is doing? Or are you going to be only satisfied with being normal, being what the king has determined for us? Okay, so for the rest of this message, I'll point over here. I'm talking about average. That's marking me against everyone else. I'll point over here. I'm talking about normal. This is what the king says is normal. I'm asking us this afternoon to consider being normal 
Christians. So as we look at John chapter 15, we're going to be moving instead of thinking about normal by average, average, we want normal, that is the power of the cross. John 15, verse 1 through 5, Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, that is the farmer. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he prunes, he takes it away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges or he cuts it back a little bit. Why? So that it's more fruity. I'm encouraging us all today to be fruity disciples. <laughs> We're going to produce fruit in line with the vine. When you look at an apple tree, you don't expect to find a banana. When you look at a watermelon plant, you would be shocked to find walnuts because it's a biblical principle. Every tree produces after its kind. And if we are in the true vine, the fruit that we produce is out of that true vine, and it's not out of you, and it's not out of me. So we are called to be fruity. Where that fruit is going to match our master. I'm not talking about, this is not average living, but it's normal living. So we are not going to be satisfied with praying how everyone else prays. Because that's comparing us to one another. And the Bible says that's not very smart. Instead, we want to know what is normal. What does it look like for us to be a disciple? In this chapter, Jesus gives us three fruit forms. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So to produce good fruit, you have to be clean. It's best. Uh, you know, the saying is grass is always greener on the other side of the fence or over the septic tank. <laughs> That's where the grass is greener. So you'll see cows stretching their neck to get on the other side of the fence, but I suggest you not eat the grass over the septic tank. Growing in toxic soil does not produce good fruit. So how do you clean up the soil? This is not a super fun project. The federal government's come in and scrape off 10 inches of topsoil and bring in other soil. That had to happen to my children one time. The soil was contaminated by local lead mines. So the federal government paid for the whole town. Everybody, they lost the top eight inches of their yard and new soil was brought in because the soil was contaminated. And if you're eating fruit out of contaminated soil, you destroy yourself. Kind of like Troy, Michigan. Drinking water out of lead pipes harms kids. So as we're talking about producing good fruit, we have to be made clean through the word which Jesus spoke. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except you abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, he is very fruity. He produces much fruit. Why? Because this is the natural way of things. I have never seen a bunny rabbit reproduction seminar being advertised. There's something about putting Daddy Wabbit and Mama Wabbit in the same cage, wait a few months, and you got a whole lot of baby Wabbits. You don't need a seminar on how to produce good fruit. You just need to be tapped into the right source. And you got to quit looking at average what's everybody else doing. Instead, start saying, what does he want me to produce? I want that to be my normal. 
may not be exciting to other people, but when it's normal from Jesus, that's what I get excited about. The words of Jesus changes things. Next slide. The words of Jesus changes things. Our world has boardroom. Hit the button one more time. The world, world has boardroom mentality. You're important if you have the bigger desk or the corner office or the bigger paycheck. The, uh, I think it was Michigan State just signed a contract with their football coach. $9.8 million a year. Are you really telling me that telling a bunch of 23 to 24-year-old boys how to get concussions <laughs> is worth $9.8 million a year? Evidently, in an average world, it is. On the other hand, the words of Jesus means take on the towel. Hit the button for me one more time, please. There we go. Following Jesus, instead of saying my value, instead of having people listen to me or having the biggest bank account, listening to the words of Jesus takes on the towel, the towel of service. That isn't average. Everybody in our world wants to be a leader, not a servant. But following Jesus, you know what becomes normal? Being a servant, just like our Jesus was a servant. Doesn't come to be a master, he said. I came to serve. You're following Jesus. You know what you should anticipate? You should anticipate being a servant. Next slide, please. In our world, changes things. Our world says, keep calm and don't get mad, just get even. Retribution. Identifying yourself as someone who has been harmed or a victim status. And now how do I get even with that? In Jesus, however, we are called to forgive. The world, the average way of thinking is harboring the pain and the difficulty and using that pain to your advantage. The normal thing in Jesus is learning how to forgive as we have been forgiven. Hearing the words of Jesus changes things. In this world, treasures are in pearls and rubies and diamonds and skyscrapers. Next slide, please. It's in a treasure box. That's what is valuable in our world. That's average thinking. In Jesus, however, relationships are valuable. You do know in the Roman world that children were worth nothing? Nothing. As a matter of fact, there is one soldier who told his wife, I'm going to be gone when the baby's born. He wrote her a letter. I'm going to be gone when the baby's born. If it's a boy, let him live. Because it was a dad's responsibility in the Roman world to thumbs up on child living or thumbs down on child living. And dad decided, I want a son, not a daughter. If it's a daughter, just take her out with the garbage and leave her there. Abandon her there. But Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Because his value wasn't, we're in resources, the value is in relationship. In this world, there are limited resources. Next slide, please. There's, there's a fighting over resources and trying to stretch those resources because you can never have enough. On the other hand, hearing the words of Jesus lets us know that there is wave after wave of grace. There is no limits to his resources. When you receive a blessing of an almighty God, there's no less resources available to someone else being blessed. We're not fighting over God's blessings. We're encouraging each of us to stand under those waves of grace. Next slide, please. Our world, there's a fear of tomorrow. When's the stock market going to crash? Because if I knew the answer to that, I could pull my 50 cents out of the stock market today. (laughs) And after it crashed and I knew how far it would go, I'd put my 50 cents back in when it's at the lowest place. Because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I'm afraid of the next set of riots that go through Milwaukee. 
I'm afraid of the next school shooting. I'm afraid of changing careers. I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I'm afraid if this is even a safe enough world to have children or not. Let me tell you, if you lived in an average world, that's a legit question. Should you have kids or not? If you live in a normal world, having children is a testimony of God's grace and a recognition that life is precious and from above and that God is in charge. Fear of the future. In Christ, however, we have hope. We have hope. I know the plans that I have for you. That's in the book of Jeremiah, written during a time of chaos. He says, I have a plan for you. So even in exile, buy a house, get married, have kids. Because I know that your future isn't in exile. Your future is in blessings. Wherever you are today, you need not fear tomorrow. You know the one who has everything in his hands. How do we switch from average thinking to normal thinking? Next slide. We do that through the washing of the water of the word. We get cleansed. Our mind gets purified. Everyone else is afraid. That's average. Instead, I want normal thinking. If we serve the prince of peace, we should have peace. That's normal. That is normal. It may not be average in a world where there's wars and rumors of wars. Men's hearts failing them for fear, that's average. But what's normal? I have my mind stayed on you, O Lord. I will meditate on you in the night hour. You are my buckler and my shield. You are my fortress and my strong tower. I will not be afraid what others may do to me. And even when I fall, don't rejoice over me because I shall arise. How can you do that? It's by the water washing of our mind, the washing of our emotions, the washing of our actions. So as we look to verse number 7, Jesus is talking about the normal kind of fruit that he is producing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall Ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. You're going to be my disciples. So here's fruitiness number one. Just ask. Just ask. Now, now before you jump too far, I've got to tell you what average praying is. Here's average praying. My back hurts. Here's average praying. I like to have a nicer house and my car's transmission just went out. Here's average praying. Got to make sure my kids get into the right universities and please with a scholarship so it doesn't put us in debt for the next 93 years. That's average praying. Normal praying is you abide in his words and his words abide in you. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things, stuff most folks are praying for. Food, where you're going to live and what you're going to wear, the basic survival needs of life. That's where most people pray. Survival, uh, uh, protection from pain, finding respect. That's average praying. Normal praying leaves that to the footnotes. God's going to take care of all of that stuff. Instead, he has invited me into the world's transformation. God is at work reconciling all things unto himself. And because of that, I can pray in line with his purposes and his design. And when I join Jesus' mission, the Father will answer, yes, here it is, and the Father will be glorified. Miracles are not about us. That's average thinking. If I have a tumor, average thinking is if God loves me, 
he will take away my tumor. Average praying is if it hasn't happened yet, it's because I don't have enough faith. Or I can't get everybody else to agree with me. And if we could just fast a few more days. And if I can get enough people to get some prayer credits in heaven. Or you'll hear people say, well, Oh, you've been such a good guy or gal that you deserve a healing. That's average thinking. Normal thinking is, Lord, how can you best be glorified through this circumstance? If you choose to heal me, it's because that's going to witness to your power in a world that's powerless. If you choose to have me go to the oncology ward for treatment every week for the rest of my life, which may only be six months, I have just one prayer request then, O oh Lord. Would you let me witness peace as life slips from my body so someone else can know you, the Prince of Peace? That's normal praying. Average praying, I won't know if God loves me unless he heals me. Normal praying, he loved me when I was a sinner. How much more he loves me now that I'm his precious son and daughter. So I have the freedom to pray normally. I can pray, Lord, whatever brings you glory, that's what I want right here and right now. Some of you will get houses in nice neighborhoods and your normal prayer is going to be, Lord, how does me having a house in this neighborhood be a light to this neighborhood? Some of you will be in Section 8 housing, subsidized by the federal government. I've lived there before, no shame in any of that. But you, what your normal prayer is going to be? It's not going to be get me out of Section 8 housing. That's average praying. Average praying is I'm ashamed of living in Section 8 housing. What are people going to think about me? Because everybody in my neighborhood is Section 8 housing. They see me driving there. What kind of Christian are you? God doesn't love you enough to give you your own house. Instead, the government's got to pay. That's average praying. Normal praying is these folks deserve a witness just like everybody else deserves a witness. So Jesus, leave me here until my job is done here and then you'll take me someplace else. Can you see the difference between average praying and normal praying? You can only pray this way if you abide in Jesus and his words abide in you. Because one day somebody came to Jesus and said, Jesus, can I follow you? And Jesus says, I don't think you want to, Bubba. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. I don't know where I'm crashing tonight. That's the Jim translation, slightly different than the King James translation, but you get the idea. Jesus says, I, my kingdom's not about fine houses. Check out where I was born. Check out who was witness to my birth. Wise guys didn't come when he was born. They came when he was about two years old. Witnesses to his birth was the lowest of the society's rungs. A couple of shepherd boys came to watch a pregnant teenage mama that was unwed give birth. I'm not concerned about the big house. And I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight, so follow me. If you're willing to go a normal life that says, I will take care of you, then I'm going to do it with what brings glory to the Father. Ask, ask abundantly. I'm saying right now the Pentecostals of Wisconsin, he's taking you into a season of renewed prayer focus. But that renewed prayer focus is going to be illuminated by a vision of what's normal and an absolute rejection of average. A rejection of self and walking into the normal of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This kind of kingdom praying at Pentecostals of Wisconsin is going to be driven by a new capacity to see. 
Be careful. Don't ask for this gifting unless you're willing to see things which are sometimes disconcerting. He's going to show you things that can only be transformed by the power of heaven. So if you ask, oh Lord, I want this form of fruit, you need to pray for your emotions because he's going to show you some stuff which may tear your guts out. But it's going to drive you to your knees in prayer. Say, dear God, there's too much pain in Milwaukee metro area, too much suffering, and you just showed some more of it to me today. I don't want this to be hid from my eyes I want this to be right at the front of my mind as I go into a heavenly throne room in prayer. You said it's your will that every family, every nation on earth know your name. So I'm asking you, O Lord, in the chaos of metro Milwaukee area, let your grace be known here and your healing known here instead of the pain and the sorrow that is here. You will ask what you will and the Father will do it. But where does your will come from? It comes from abiding in Jesus and His Word abiding in you. In other words, if you're not hanging out in the Word, you're going to have average praying. Okay? Average praying doesn't have the Word in it. It starts with what are your needs. Most Christians in America have average prayer lives. Because their prayers are based on their need. Normal praying is based on the king's need. You want your prayer life to go to a new dimension? Step out of average into normal. This doesn't require jumping high or cutting yourself. It doesn't require dancing long. Remember the prophet? Prophets of Baal, they spent all morning dancing and screaming and sticking skewers in their bodies, showing how dedicated they were to their God. That's average praying. Our prayers are not going to be judged by how much we sweat when we pray. Our prayers are going to be judged by are we hanging out in Jesus and His Word hanging out in us, and we pray based on the King's need not our need. Go back to the example of a tumor in your body. How could the king use this for his glory? He still heals today. But there are also brothers and sisters who die from cancer today. Are you telling me that the sister who dies from a tumor didn't have faith in God, didn't trust God? No, 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 that has nothing to do with it. Both sisters, the one survived and the one that died, need normal praying. Lord, what do you need done in this circumstance? Be glorified through this circumstance. We are going to stop average praying that's based on our need. And we're going to start hanging out with Jesus and his word in us. It wouldn't hurt you from time to time, disciples, to share your prayer list with others. Not just so others can join you in prayer, but so others can help you discern. Are you praying an average way, measured by how everybody else prays? Or how is this lining up with the Word? Things on your prayer list should have biblical texts written next to them. That's what Jesus said. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will pray what you will. The difference is, is your will has been washed by his words, and now your will is in line with his will. Amen. So things that are on your prayer list should have kingdom texts next to them, and they will always be about the king's will, not needs, not your needs. Does that make sense? Yeah. But is this a switch for most of us? Oh, it is. Most of us have been praying feeble prayers. Because we've been praying like everybody else. Ask God what you need, and he will give it to you. That's not what the Word says. 
The word says, if your word abide in you, you will ask what you will. So, Lord, what do you want done? What do you want done on my job, Lord? Not that I need a raise or I need respect or I need a, I deserve a promotion. You're not going to pray that way anymore because that's average praying. Instead, you're going to say, Lord, you sent me as to be salt and light on this job. Is this the place to do it or can you open doors so I can be more effective in doing that? In Jesus' name, you'll pray, and the Father will do it. So that's fruitiness number one. Just ask. Let's look at the next verse here. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And this is my commandment, that you love one another. I love you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Next slide. Our call to fruitiness is receiving the love of God to such a dimension that we will be able to love others, whether they are like us or whether they are our enemies. Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mountain, I say, love your neighbor. Even the Gentiles can love those which are like him. But I say to you, love your enemies, love those who spitefully use you. In our world today, average thinking, average loving is stranger danger. Strangers are a threat to you. And now with COVID, that means anybody that's breathing within six feet of you without a mask. <laughs> Have you noticed over the last 18 months, you almost used to, if you bumped into somebody in the grocery store, you said, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Now, if you violate the six-foot rule, you start apologizing. Oops, I'm so sorry. And you're, We have become, I'm not minimizing the risk of this virus at all, but we have even increased it to now everybody is a threat to my existence. Jesus, on the other hand, is calling us to a normal existence where we have been so loved by God that we can now love others as we have been loved. Here's how we start loving normally. First of all, you got to receive God's love into your spirit. Don't try to love on your own or you're going to hate you, hurt yourself. Have you ever seen those commercials that say in the fine print, this was done by a professional driver on a closed course. Don't try this at home. Don't try loving your enemies on your own. You're going to hurt yourself. But if you receive God's love in you and the fullness of his dimension, then you're going to be able to love your neighbors, love your enemies, even those who spitefully use you. You're going to quit doing the stranger danger thing, uh, philiozenia, stranger danger. You're going to do... Uh, uh, the Philadelphia thing. You're going to love the stranger uh, instead of stranger danger. The love of God, we receive it. It's unconditionally available. God unconditionally makes his love available. But we recognize that that love is conditionally accessed. If you love me, then you will love one another. If you are my servants, you will love one another. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. If you love him, then you follow his command. You will love others. Now, that is not average. Average American understanding is love is let love go. If love is true, it's like a butterfly and it will come back to you. Unless it meets my windshield on my truck first. Average love is you fall into love like it's a pothole. <laughs> but then somehow you fall out of love. It has negative G-force and throws you out of the pothole. That's our world's understanding of love. Normal love is I have been so lavishly loved by God, I follow his command. And here's his number one command, love others even if they don't deserve it. Yeah. 
Usually we reserve love for those who have earned it or worthy of it or proved themselves. Jesus says, you didn't prove it, you didn't earn it, but I dumped love on you anyway, so why don't you get normal around here? Step out of your average loving. Well, I loved them for six months, and I kept track. As I promised up front, I'll love until you violate that love. And then I have to protect myself. Because you see how that's average? Got to, the key is reducing my own pain. Most people in America today have average marriages. Average meaning they get married because they love themselves. Now, it's not about loving the other. It's about loving themselves. If I can get married to someone and be with them, we will stay together as long as our lives don't separate. As long as it's good for me, as long as it's healthy for me, I will stay. Uh, they're in love with the critter they see in the mirror. That's average love. Okay, I, I was in a... Ph.D. course one time uh, in family studies, and one of my colleagues in the course, she got married. And someone says, well, congratulations. She says, yeah, I'll stay married as long as it's good for me. Her marriage license needed to come with an expiration date. <laughs> with an option for renewal if both parties agreed. That's average in our world today. Normal love says, I'm going to keep on loving. Now, pause for a second. This does not include domestic violence. You can love someone who has committed domestic violence against you, but you will probably need to separate from them, particularly if there are children involved. There's a passage in Malachi that says God hates divorce. The rest of the verse says, and he hates garments stained by blood. So God's against divorce, and he's against domestic violence. Okay? Well, what's the answer? The answer is that both parties get baptized in his love again. And even if we have a misunderstanding, we're going to keep on loving each other normally, not average-wise, but normally. If I have a disagreement with my spouse, I'm going to pray that they and I experience God's love in a new dimension. So we know how to love, love each other in this new season of our lives so that we can be effective kingdom agents with a normal marriage. Not an average one, but a normal one. Anybody want to follow Jesus? Anybody want to be tapped into the tree so you can become fruity in our world today? This is going to look crazy in our world today because they're used to average. They're used for folks sticking up for number one. And they have thing one on their chest. Right? Thing one. Everybody else is thing two. They are thing one. That's average. Here's normal. We stick up for number one too. Hear, O Israel. Our God is one. And we're going to love him and serve him with our whole being. I stick up for number one, but I got a new normal. I'm not average anymore. I'm not the one. At the cross, it decentered me and put Jesus in the middle of my life. So now I stick up for number one. I'm sticking up for Jesus and I'm following him, which means I love lavishly as I have been loved lavishly. Our world can, will never understand this. They will spit in your face and they will ridicule you to see if you truly believe what you're talking about. Has anybody done adoptions in the room? Is there anybody that's done adoptions? Give the example from adoption. Many adopted children, particularly if they're 10 or 11, they've been bumped foster home to foster home to foster home to foster home. They've heard over and over again, we will love you no matter what you do. And each time, that person was not able to back up their words. So when you adopt that child and you tell them, 
I will love you no matter what. You know what that child will do? The child will do the most heinous thing they can think of because they want to know if you speak truth or not. I don't want to love these new adoptive parents until I find out that they can back up their word to love me because everybody else was average. But when it got too difficult or inconvenient, they bumped me to the curve or used me for themselves. So I'm going to test it. Brothers and sisters, can you affirm with me that God loved you even when you were unlovable? <laughs> I'm not asking you to give me the date that you were so miserably unlovable. But we all got some examples in mind. I was unlovable, but my Jesus loved me anyway. So I take the risk today to be tapped into Jesus and Jesus in me. So I stop loving in an average way and start loving in the normal way that I love for the benefit of the other, not the benefit of myself. Because average love is for what I get out of it. Normal love is because I have been loved and because His love sends me to love, I will do so. And matter of fact, even if the person I'm loving gets angry with me, my love need has been completely fulfilled by Jesus. So my emotions aren't trashed. My mind isn't confused. I will continue loving anyway because my love need is completed by the one that I served. I'm tapped into the true vine. And Jesus loves me beyond my capacity to grasp. So when I love in the name of Jesus and it's rejected, it doesn't harm me the way it normal, average wise would. Now, what's going to happen, brothers and sisters, is when that happens to you, you're going to have an emotional drop. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go back to the Word and remember, oh, He loves me completely. I wasn't loving that person to get love back. I've already been loved more than I can understand. I'm loving others out of the outflow of God's love for me. So therefore, when I'm rejected when I love somebody else, my emotions can have a reset. You will have a momentary drop because we walk in this world, but you're going to tap back into the root system one more time, and you're going to say, Love, reset, my Lord, reset my love quotient, would you? Show me one more time how much you love me, lavishly care for me, which is going to give me the resources to continue to love someone else in your name. I posit to you that Milwaukee needs a loving church. Wisconsin needs a loving example. It will not always be appreciated or valued. That's why you're here. If it were always appreciated and valued, there would have been no need for the cross. We would have matter of fact said the cross wasn't necessary. It was redundant. It wasn't needed. Brothers and sisters, the cross is necessary to demonstrate God's love for you and for me, which gives us the risk-taking ability to be normal in 2022. As we're getting ready to go into 2022, we're praying, Lord, we want to be normal disciples in 2022. We want to love our world even if they don't like us. Even if they call us weird, uptight Christians. Even if they call us a people who are not loving because we don't accept everyone's lifestyle as valid. We accept everyone as lovable, but we don't accept every lifestyle as pleasing to God. We will love everyone with whom we come contact, even if they are radically different in every dimension you could imagine. But we will also say, God has a better plan for you. We will love the murderer that's on federal death row. We will love them even though this person in Michigan just killed several kids at school and the parents seem to have been 
contributors to the, Christ, the, the heinous crime. I don't understand someone that pulls out a weapon and blows away innocent people. But here's what I can say. God wondrously loves you, and I will love you, and I will not stop loving you. But I want you to know this love that God sends through me into you can break up the hardness of your heart and the hardness of your emotions and the despair that you feel right now. And God's grace is available on death row and on skid row. God's grace is available on the parade, pride parade. His love is available to those who rip off seniors with the mismanagement of their funds. God's love is available to all. So the media may call you names by walking faithfully in Christ. You know what your response is? I love you. And you know what that's going to make them? Mad. Because you know what's average? Somebody says, I hate you. Then your response is, I hate you more. We're into a retribalization in America. Instead of being one nation under God like we tried to be for seasons, we're retribalizing. We're drawing into significant pockets of people, coming up with our own truth, our own values, everything. But when we switch over to being normal, I have to love others regardless of the tribe they belong to. And I don't only have to, I get to. And when they say, I hate you, your response is, and I love you. It's going to confuse them. It's going to make them more angry. They will write more editorials about how the church is mean-spirited because it said they love them when, of course, you can't love me. And you're going to say, oh, yes, I do. Just watch. Fruitiness number one, we're going to pray normal prayers. Fruitiness number two, we're going to love as Jesus loved. Let's look at fruitiness number three. These things have I spoken unto you. Notice the spoken word is important, right? We are washed by his word. He says, I speak these things unto you. Uh, Ed Wimberly, a, a fantastic uh, pastoral theologian, he calls this privileging God's conversation. Okay, Ed Wimberly is an African-American pastoral theologian. He's a great writer. I've enjoyed his materials much. And one of the key takeaways, he says, you've got to privilege God's conversation. Others may say things, but what does God say about you? You may have been told your whole life you're worthless, you can't measure up to anything because you're the third child or you're not as good looking as your bigger sister was or on and on the list goes. You might have heard those tapes your whole life that you're worthless, but God said, I breathed into you and gave you life. Before your mama even knew she was pregnant, I knew your name. and I knew the life that you would live, and I am for you. God says you're valuable. You better privilege that. Disciples privilege the word of Jesus over every other voice. I've spoken these things unto you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Here's normal fruit. Slide two. Here's normal fruit. When you touch Jesus, do you realize how overjoyed Jesus is with you? We're getting ready to go into a season of corporate worship here in a few moments. I wish we could see through the eyes of Jesus in John 15 that as we worship him, his face is overjoyed with us. There's someone in this room right now that needs an emotional climate change. Our world needs an emotional climate change. A climate that says God can be overjoyed with us. I need you right now. If you wouldn't mind, just put it your hand on your cheek. Imagine it's the hand of Jesus. And Jesus' words towards you is, I am overjoyed 
When I think about you, I want to laugh. <laughs> when I watch you, even in your struggles to be a faithful disciple, when I watch you and your continued efforts to be near me, I am overjoyed by your life. Receive my joy right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray the joy of the Lord in the house right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray the joy of the Lord in your home right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray joy in your marriage, joy in your parenting, joy in taking care of a senior. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, joy on your job as you walk as a disciple. I pray joy in your life right now. And I pray the joy of Jesus be received until your belly laugh come back until the joy of your spirit be restored. Receive Jesus' as joy until your joy is full. Anybody that will receive that prayer, would you raise your hand right now and say, Lord Jesus, I receive it. I receive it right now. Oh, Lord, it's been a little hard for me in this season to have joy. My, my joy quotient is down to Zippo. But right now, I receive your joy, and your joy will fill my heart until my joy is complete. I receive the delight of Jesus. I receive the joy of Jesus. Jesus is pleased with my commitment to do his will. He is pleased with my efforts, even though sometimes I think my efforts are feeble, and I think my efforts are unworthy of his goodness. He is pleased with with my efforts and when I fail he still calls me back with joy and not hatred he doesn't push me away he rejoices and calls me home one more time receive the joy of the Lord right now Whew. somebody needs to breathe deeply right now just breathe in the joy of the Lord. Let your lungs fill up with his joy right now. You are weary and you are heavy laden. Oh, just breathe in right now the joy of the Lord. You think that your labors are in vain and your life is not worth anything. Oh, no. Oh, no. Be steadfast and unmovable. Your labors are never in vain. Breathe deeply the joy. Woo, the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Oh. Come on, breathe it in one more time. Woo, the joy of the Lord. That's my strength. <laughs> Oh, the joy. I don't have to prove anything to him. I get to walk normally in him. And when I'm weary, he still loves me. And he is still overjoyed with me. And he still sees potential in me. Ooh, just receive the joy of the Lord. Mmm. 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 My favorite aunt's name was Euline. She passed away several years ago. It was my mother's older, my mother's sister, a little bit older than my mother. She was my favorite aunt. I got to live in her house for several months for a season. But when I had a ruptured appendix when I was about nine, she came to New York to make sure my mama was taking care of me properly. Uh, it's just she's that kind of aunt. There was a sense in which when I was with Aunt Euline. That, there was, that she was overjoyed with me being her nephew. Later in her senior years, she said, you know, gray hair, a little bit pudgy. She would say, you know, what's not to like about me? She would say of herself. She just says, I assume people like me because, duh, What's not to like about me? <laughs> when you have that attitude, you can receive, give joy to other people because you're not evaluating things 
You've kind of finally gotten to the place where you know that you bring joy to Jesus. You know that there's some flaws in your crackpot that you are. But that even makes you a little more unique and valuable to the master. Jesus is overjoyed with you. Even the pieces that you don't like about you, the pieces you would get rid of, like the apostle Paul prayed three times to get rid of a thorn in his flesh, and the Lord says, no, I like you that way. And my grace is sufficient. That stuff that you would get rid of, I'll confess, there's some stuff of me I'd get rid of if I had half a chance. Anybody else willing to confess with me? There's some stuff in your life you'd get rid of if you had that. There's some of your yesterdays you would go back and you'd get rid of them. You'd tear that chapter out of the book if you could. Jesus says, no, I like you that way because you're choosing to walk in me. I'm overjoyed with you. And anything that's weak in you, my grace makes up the difference. Oh, if you were completely likable in who you were, you would be without grace. Hmm. And some people try to live that way. They try to live gracelessly. They try to live it all on their own. And Jesus is saying, would you just let my grace make up the difference? And as I grace you, you will walk closer to my purposes and my design. In conclusion, you were picked for this. You are picked for this. By the time I was in sixth grade, I was the tallest kid in class. When I went to a different high school for ninth grade, they thought I was a senior. <laughs> so I didn't get any freshman hazing, which I took that as a blessing. The downside of growing up too fast is you can't chew bubble gum and walk at the same time. And you all saw me last time when I was here. I face planted myself. Right over there, because pastor asked me to look at my socks and walk at the same time. And, <laughs> and you all saw the results of that. Which meant in gym class, even playing basketball. First time we played basketball, I was picked first, because I was the tallest. But then they figured out, dribbling and running, Jim cannot do. So I got picked last. But for this normal life, some of you are saying, I can't pray like that. I can't love like that. I can't experience joy like you're talking about, Jim. I, the best I can do is live average and hope to be saved. No, 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 no. You didn't pick me, but I chose you. And I ordained you that you should go for, bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. These things command you that you love one another. If the world hate you, you know they hated me first. Let's stand together, shall we? No one in the room needs to jump up and down, say, pick me, pick me, pick me. You've been chosen. You're already chosen, and you're ordained with normal living. Lord Jesus, we dedicate our days. We dedicate our hours. We dedicate our moments, each moment to you. And we ask you, by your grace and by your mercy, let there be normal living in us. We want a new dimension of prayer in 2022. We want a new dimension of loving others in 2022. Even though you're going to have to reveal to us some unlovable people and ask us to go in your name and love them anyway, we pray it in Jesus' name. And finally, O oh Lord, we've got to be a people of joy in 2022, celebrating your goodness in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. If you remain standing for a moment, Sister Emily, is she here? She's leading in prayer. Um, as he was speaking here, um, something really hit me he said if you want to change from preaching you have to address the cognitive the emotional and behavioral responses of your life and that it's easy to hear something cognitive wise but then to put it into behavioral response can be challenging 
I think we all can relate to that. And so as he was speaking, the story of, uh, and this is a prophetic word here for prayer. If, if, I don't know where Emily is, but if she's around, she should be coming. Um, but the prophetic word here is the Lord said there are some people here, at least half this audience, that have been facing some disappointments without a behavioral change. You've, expect, you've accepted cognitive preaching, and, but there's a struggle between the emotion and the behavior. And uh, when Jesus allowed Lazarus to die, Martha came out and confronted him, but Mary stayed at the house. And she said, if you had not died, if my, if my brother had been, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Mary stayed. And Jesus said this. This is the part that I want to pray with here for just a moment. This is the prophetic part. He said, uh, go and get your sister. And when she went to Mary, she said, the, the master has called for you. He knew she was disappointed. She knew that she understood him cognitively. And to a certain degree, she understood the emotions. She's the, they say some, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but the woman that washed his feet, or this is the woman that showed some, Mary, and showed some, some affection towards him. And, and now she's disappointed. And it could be something on our job, something in our marriage, something in our health, something in our home. But the Lord is saying, I, 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 the master is calling you. Even though you wanted to stay home today, even though you really didn't want to come out, the master is calling, knowing that you were disappointed with a failed expectation. And when he says, I call for you, that's a powerful statement coming from a God that says, in spite of your disappointment, in spite of your cognitive and your behavioral responses are not adding up, I'm calling for you right now. I want to heal that part that has been disappointed because there's a I'm the only thing that can resurrect something that's died in you. And I am the resurrection. And I want to resurrect something that has died in you from a failed expectation because you've been hurt over and over. You've been disappointed over and over. And you knew I, I was coming here today. You decided to stay and remain. And the Lord is saying if that is you, to lift your voice because the master has called for you. Come on up, Emily. The master has called for you. And he's saying when there's a prophetic word, I'm now ready to touch that part of you that has been so discouraged that has been so disappointed that if you were released, come on, Mary. If you'd only been here, God, you could have changed this situation. You could have changed my marriage. You, all you could have did is did this. And, and Why am I still fi fighting in my health? Why am I still in this situation where I am? I want to tell you by prophetic utterance here, the master's calling. He's calling for you, even though he knows you're here physically, but, but at, you're still at home. You've compartmentalized your cognitive, emotional behavior. God said, I'm calling for all three here today to make a response to the prophetic utterance that there may be an ushering to come forth of a healing strength. Come on, let it out, Quran. Come on. You don't get no brownie points for just being here. But what God responds to is when Mary came out of the house, he knew she was still discouraged. He knew she was still disappointed. That which meant most of her had died. And Jesus is saying, I'm calling for you. I'm calling for you. Don't you understand what he's calling? That he wants to, he's seeing beyond your hurt. He is seeing beyond your pain. He is seeing something deeper in you that he wants to use. And if it wasn't for your pain, uh, he wouldn't even be calling you. He's calling for you. Come on, lift your voice. That's it, Yesenia. Come on. Come on. Something is shifting in here. Tasha, come on, Sister Cruz. He's calling for you. There's no shame in staying home, recognizing, yes, God, over and over, I've, I've been disappointed. The shame is not getting up when the master calls. And he's saying, if I've called for you, let your shame go, Mephibosheth. That's what his name meant, son of shame. Let your shame go. Let your anger go. Let that confusion go and come to the master. Hallelujah. 
Because when the prophetic water is goes forth, God say, now, 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 Mary, you are at your feet and you anointed my feet at a time your brother was alive. But when I let your brother die, when I let something next to you die, you are now closer to me when you come out of that house than you was when you were at my feet. Because now I'm going to show you a sign of my redemptive, intimate love and glory that you could not see when you were washing my feet. Come on. Come on. There is an angelic presence in this room that the prophet has brought in here. I said there's an angelic presence in this room that the prophet, Dr. Littles, has brought into this room. However way you want to do this, however way you want to, we're just going to follow the flow of the Holy Ghost as Sister Emily leads us in the name of Jesus. Come on. Give him that deferred hope. Deferred hope makes the heart sad. It makes the bones rotten. It makes you physically sick. It makes you emotional insane. You've got to get, get over. Give God those bones of disappointment that's been rocking your body and your health. I'm tired of this oppression. I'm tired of this depression. I'm not staying in the house when the master is calling. Martha said, Mary, he's calling for you right now. Oh, Father, we come to you, Lord, today, God. Oh, God, and we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. There is none that is like you, Jesus. There is none that is before you, God. There is none that is beside you, God. There will be none after you, Lord, oh, Lord. Let it not be said that those who, hallelujah, have the revelation of you now worship you in this house today, God. Oh, let it not be said that those who knew who you were did not acknowledge you, hallelujah, through the ends of the earth, Lord God. That's it, church. Neither gave the praise in your name, hallelujah. Your name, that the praise of your name that was due, God. Let it be never said that we took your name upon, that we took your name upon us and we took your identity, Lord God, of your name, Lord God. We become the people of your name, God. That said and did it in vain, God. Hallelujah, because we did not act upon it, God. We did not reflect on your nature, Lord, or did we not wait upon you to serve you with all of our hearts? That's it. Oh, let us not be lukewarm in this house. Oh, so, Father, Father, I pray, let us not be dispassionate, God. I ask you today, oh, Lord, I ask you that you can renew, Lord God, our hearts today. Renew our passion, oh, God. Renew our love for one another, God. Oh, you, oh, Lord, hallelujah. For you, hallelujah, for us even if we pray, it feels almost sacrilegious because we should always burn hot for you, God. Hallelujah, that's it, that's it. But we know, hallelujah, that flesh, oh, it's flesh, it's flesh, it's flesh. And we have to take on the flesh to the cross today, hallelujah. We have to put our flesh on the cross and we put it upon your shoulders today, God, and deny ourselves, God. Hallelujah, that's it. Hallelujah. Oh, God, the carnal mind is enmity against you. It's an enemy, and so we are crucified with you today, oh, God. By faith, we are dead, dead to this world, dead to our own desires, dead, hallelujah, dead to our desires. I'm crucified to this world. Oh, and the world is crucified to me. Oh, Lord, the prince of this world come and has nothing in me. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you, church, want to lay it down right now to the Lord? Oh, God, I lay it down, Lord Jesus. I lay it down. I put my flesh on this altar today, God. I put my body on this altar today, God. Hallelujah. I put myself on this altar today, God. In Jesus' name, take over my eyes today, God. My ears, Lord God. My smelling, my tasting my touching today God let me feel after you oh God let me hear you oh Lord let me see in the spirit opening eyes hallelujah that I can see church I want you I want you to pray with me right now church open up my eyes begin to say God open up my eyes that I can see oh Lord that I can see your majesty that I can see your
That's it. Begin to touch the hem of his garment. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Jesus' name, let that river flow. Hallelujah, God. We worship you, Jesus, in this house, God. We thank you, Lord, for calling us, Lord God, for drawing us into that secret place, into the closeness of your presence. Hallelujah. Into the nearness, oh God, of your press, of your person, into the recognition of who you are, God. Again, that you are always there. You are always with us, Lord. Hallelujah. That we would have God conscious, amen, that we would respect who you are, that we would have the fear of the Lord. Put your hands on your head right now, and I want us to pray that God would transform our mind in this service today, that God would transform our mind and our lives, hallelujah, for what Dr. Littles has taught us today. Lord, let your word, your word says that be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of our minds. Prove what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Oh, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, renew our minds in this house today, God. Renew our mind and our thoughts, hallelujah, that we would think like you. How many of us want to think like God? That's it. Oh, I would be, hallelujah. Oh, I would want to think like you, oh God, that our emotions, Lord God, would be like you, God. That I would be in the range, Lord God, of the fruit of the Spirit, which is God's emotions. The fruit of the Spirit are the emotions of God. Let me manifest those emotions, God, in this house today with my brother and my sister, Lord God. Oh, let me have patience with them, Lord God. Oh, let me love my brother and sister in this house today, God. Oh, teach me to be a disciple so that I can disciple God. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Let us be, hallelujah, people of God's heart that we would love, hallelujah, what God loves for the same reason. Hate what God hates for the same reason. Oh, Lord Jesus, that you would cause us to have your desires, Lord God. Delight yourself in the Lord and he would give you the desires of your heart, the Bible says. Hallelujah. Begin to exalt God. Begin to lift up his name. Lift up your arms and begin to shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. We worship you in this house today, God. We worship you, Lord God, for what you're doing in our hearts today, God. For what you've done, what you're about to do, God. Hallelujah. Thank you for the seeds that are growing in each and every one of us, Lord God. Thank you for the desire that you put in us to disciple, Lord God. To Hallelujah. To help people, Lord God. To bring them into relationship with you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. La, 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 be a flow of the spirit in this house today hallelujah oh let there be a fire at the altar hallelujah that's it hallelujah god give us the desires of your heart oh god i give you my will today god that your will would be manifest in this place today that your will lord god hallelujah would have its way in this house lord god that there would be people that are change in this through this ministry today god that there would be a changed heart lord god that somebody would turn away from their wicked ways lord god and repent lord god and be drawn closer to you hallelujah Yes, hallelujah. How many of you have a desire for souls? How many of you have a desire to disciple someone after this, this weekend? How many of you, hallelujah, begin to trust God that God would give you somebody to minister to? That's it, hallelujah. Begin to pray that God will open up every door, hallelujah. Every situation, he is in control of every situation. That's it, that's it, hallelujah, God. Yes, hallelujah, Oh, hallelujah, God, we worship you in this house. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let this house right now be a house of prayer. Oh, remember, you are now the tabernacle. God dwells in you, yandalabarobasi. Oh, hallelujah, does God know? Are you allowing God to come into your spirit right now? Or are you waiting for the music team to come? Hallelujah, Jesus. Do you believe that God will touch you where you're at? That's it. Yo la 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 la
Ya la 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 God's not done yet. Oh, there's more. Hallelujah. Is there anybody in this house that is hungry for more? For what God has today? Are you hungry for God? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could just give God a hand clap of praise this time. Hallelujah. That's it, that's it. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. Hallelujah. That's it, that's it. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. What a move. What a move of God. What a move. What a move. Let's just lift him up, lift him up. With your eyes closed, with your hands raised, lift him up, lift him up, yeah. Lift him up, lift him up. King of glory, enter. King of glory, enter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We glorify you, God. We glorify that name. We worship you. Name above all names, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I said, lift him up, lift him up. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. There's a song that's going to come from you. Sometimes I don't know what to say, so my moanings and groanings say, Whoa, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You're worthy, you're worthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Sing it out. Oh God, we worship you. 
somebody to worship with. So, when we're singing and when we're dancing, he's in the midst of our praises. And he's in the midst of his people. So when I'm worshiping, when I'm clapping my hands, I'm just not doing it because it's another Sunday service. This is a part of my life. This is an extension of what I've been doing at home. Hallelujah, Jesus. Whoa, oh, there's an army in the night. Waging war by Jesus Christ. Hey, there's no God like our God. He is awesome. Whoa, oh, yeah. Count a stir fire in my heart. Facing darkness on all sides. Oh, there's no God like He is awesome. Somebody let me say, nothing can stay. Nothing can stay against us. Our praise, we declare it. Because our God is for us, His name will bring darkness. We declare it. Oh, let's just worship Him. Hey. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm going to clap my hands. I'm going to jump, confirming what He believes about me. Hey, hey. There's an army in the night waging war by Jesus Christ. Hey, there's no God like our God. He is awesome. Yeah. I got a stirring fire in my heart. I'm facing darkness on our side. Hey. There's no God like our God. He is awesome. Hey. Nothing can stand against us. It's our prayers. Let your name be glorified. Set the fire up as I. Jesus, let your name be glorified. I'm gonna praise Him in tonight. Set the fire. I'm gonna praise Him, man. I'm gonna praise Him in the night. Jesus, let your name be glorified. To the fire of his side. Jesus, let's it. I'm gonna praise him in hey, I'm gonna praise him in the night. Jesus, let your name be glorified. Still the fire of his side. Jesus, let your name. Nothing can stand. Nothing can stand against us. Our praise will break the darkness. And we declare the keys of Jesus. Nothing can stand against us. Hey, our praise will break the darkness. We declare, we declare that Jesus He is. Oh, because our God is for us, His name will break the darkness. We declare the 
lift your voices, let's praise him in this place. Sing it out. It may look like, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing it like you believe it. Hey, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Sing it like you believe it. You've been through too much to sing it pretty. You've been through way too much to sing it like it's a normal song. Sing it like this is the last song from your soul. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, God. You brought me through a healing. You brought me through the surgery. You brought me through it all, God. I should still be laid up in bed. I should still be sick, but I'm here, God. Sing it from the bottom of your heart. Say, you may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Help me say, you may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, oh, yeah. There's a freedom. They look like I'm super. That's it, that's it. One more time, it may look like I am. They look like I'm super rounded, but let's give him all the glory.
We celebrate the kingdom. We celebrate the kingdom, the freedom of the king. Yes, yes. No more, no more, no more, no more. See what we have. The freedom because we set in our hearts, our, our eyes are like a flint. They say no more idols, no more idols. Yeah. No more idols, no more shackles holding us down. Oh no. Yes, yes, let your oh, oh. that's it, let your cry out, let your cry out. That's it, release your tongues into this atmosphere. That's it, release, release, release. Yes, get it on emotion.
Lift your voices, lift your voices. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lift your voices, lift your voices. Hallelujah, Jesus. Don't wait for the next moment, the next song. Hallelujah, don't wait for it, Jesus. Don't wait for it. Hallelujah, Jesus. I know, I know, I know. The battle is yours. It's always yours. I know, I know. Jesus, I know, I know, I know. Battle is always yours, we say, I know. I wonder if we can give God a praise right now at this place. Lift him up, lift him up. That's it, that's it. Don't give the praise team a hand clap. Won't you give God a praise right now in Jesus' name? Do it because you love him. In Jesus' name. Let nobody go, nobody go.
Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. I might be bruised, but I know the Lord will fight for me. I might be wounded, exhausted, but I know the Lord will fight for me. Teach my fingers to fight. Teach my hands to war. That's what worship is all about. Teach my fingers to fight. Teach my hands to war. He will fight my battles. He will fight my battles. Teach my fingers to fight. Teach my hands to war. He's going to fight my battles. He's going to fight my battles. Teach my fingers to fight. Teach my hands to war. He's going to fight my battles. Teach me how to love you when I'm hurt. Teach me how to praise you when I'm wounded. He's going to fight my battles. He's going to fight my battles. The Lord is on my side. He'll never leave me nor forsake you. As they're playing softly, put that verse out. It says, the Bible says, Mephibosheth dwelled in Jerusalem. We ate continually at the king's table, even though he was lame in both feet walking through his life crippled always in the handicap lane feeling dislodged with his friendships viewed as a political enemy to the kingdom house of David but David said go to Lodibar and find that man and bring him to my table there is a pull in this service to somebody that God is saying if I, if I could get you to scream cry reach for my grace that comes to the cross I will bring you to a table prepared he said before your enemies but you've got to believe Mephibosheth you've got to believe even though your name means son of shame even though it seems like you've got a background of failure even though your, your relatives in the house of Saul hated, the, hated King David you've got to believe that this is your service you got to believe that I'm bringing you to a place. I'm bringing you to a prophetic place where you can begin to experience some healing at the king's table. And he's talking to somebody here today and he's saying, I understand your background, I understand your pedigree, but I need you to believe that if I can reach down to it with a shepherd boy and give him mercy on Mephibosheth, why can't I give mercy under your conditions? Why? What would withhold other than your faith to believe that this is just my service, this is my hour for God to reconcile some things that I've battled for a long time? And so would you lift your voice for a moment? I'm talking to a Mephibosheth. That he said, when I remove the shame, it's because you begin to at least release your praise and confidence to the one who can fight your battles. Come on. When you release your praise, there's a shame. There's an inadequacy that will fall off of you. Don't ever lose that, Brother Uriah. Don't ever let the devil minimize the, the, the beauty and the power of public corporate praise. Because when he came to the king's table, David said, I don't care what your family, I don't care what they're saying, I'm going to fight your battle. I, this is my battle. I'm the king. And if I say you can come to the king's table, if I say what's been lame in you is now healed, who are you to reject that? Come on. Reach for him. Reach for him. Reach for him. The hour's dark and I need him. You'll fight my battles. 
He came to that table justified by the king. Say what you want. I might be in a wheelchair. I might not be like the rest of you, but I'm feeling a, a prophetic anointing of this service for somebody to behold. Mephibosheth had to let go of some stuff he had to forgive in order to release his praise, his worship. And as some of us that are compartmentalizing God right now, you'll deal with forgiveness at the altar call. You'll deal with it at another time with your counselor. God said, no, in my presence, I can heal that which you have struggled with. But you must believe, I've got to fight the battle. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Without any music, the Lord wants to speak. Would you just, just lift your voice here? Just lift your voice here. There's a window here. There's a window of the opportunity the Lord wants to speak. Well, let's get sensitive to spiritual giftings here. The children of Israel on the ninth plague got tired and said, how long will it take before God does what he's going to do? And Moses said, no, God's not done. This next plague is going to shake Israel or shake Egypt. And the Bible says that the, the angel of the Lord went out to camp and began to kill the firstborn of Egypt. And the Lord said, this is not going to be your fight. I'm going to fight this one, but you're going to need to obey me and get some blood on the doorpost. And I will cover for this plague that's going to hit your home, but I need your firstborn. I need the firstborn of your impatience. I need the firstborn of your idols of the heart. Because if you give me your firstborn, I will cover a blood. I don't care how bad things are going to become in the earth. I'm going to cover my people according to Isaiah 26 and 20. I'm going to hide you under the shadow of my wings. But I'm looking for someone that will put the blood. This is what worship is all about. This is what corporate agreement is all about. That whatever is going to come with the shifts that's happening to America, God is going to have a remnant of people that are, he is going to use and navigate as his bride in the earth. Is there a witness in the house? Look at your neighbor and say, that's you and me. So with courage in your worship for just a moment, would you declare the blood over your doorposts of your home? I'm talking about your heart and your family. That whatever hits this country, that God, you have a people that no matter what plague hits, you're going to have a remnant of people right here in this building against the attack of the spirit of fear, the spirit of intimidation, the spirit of seduction, the spirit of lust. Come on, let's get real. Some of you battling some stuff, and God's saying the only protection is the cover of my blood. But you got to activate it, Moses. You got to eat my word. You got to stay in the house. You got to stay accountable to leadership. Come on now. Hallelujah. Pastor's trying to activate something as the covering of this church that whatever's getting ready to happen, I'm going to protect your mind from the spirit of insanity. I'm going to protect your household. But by the authority of the name of Jesus, uh, I speak the blood covering uh, uh, and I give up my firstborn. I give up the firstborn of my heart uh, that you will protect the household and my family. God, I release uh, things that don't supposed to be in my house, uh, in my home. Uh, so when the angel passes, is over, God. Uh, the plagues that's coming to this earth, uh, you will care, protect your people. For the Lord will fight my battles. Now would you praise him for the protection of the Lord? 
Well, if you don't do it here, you're not doing it out there. I, I said, I thank him for the protection of God over the children of Israel, over the one God people. Come on, Brother Dyson. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Now, would you thank him for the miraculous? Would you thank him that, hey, hey, come on. Because they left Egypt. God's got something for you. And I believe as darkness gets darker, God gets brighter. I praise you for that. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you greet someone in the name of the Lord? Thank you for your sensitivity to the presence of God in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. Um, as uh, Brother Fakasi gets ready and then uh, Sister uh, uh, Alexis Barner, um, how many enjoyed uh, Dr. Little's prayer session this morning? Amen, amen. That I want my normalcy to be uh, normal to what the master says I am, normal to what he says I am. I don't want to be average, but normal according to the king. Uh, how many of you guys enjoyed the uh, planning meeting yesterday? I have to say, it was such a cool thing. Um, I really appreciate this new uh, concept that they added where uh, we got in groups and got to talk to each other. It was just so awesome uh, being with Brother Josh, uh, Brother Martin, uh, Sister Constance, Sister Kiosha. Uh, who am I forgetting? It was just awesome working with people. And sometimes um, you don't get a better appreciation from people from afar. But when you get in a group and you talk to them and you hit, get to hear their thoughts and how God deals with them, it gives you such a, a greater appreciation for uh, the people of God. It wasn't until Paul uh, was in prison and, and was by himself that he, he said, uh, send for John Mark, for he is profitable for me for the ministry. It wasn't until he was by himself that he understood that people in the ministry can be profitable and he had to get out of, get over his offense and hurt that John Mark caused. So uh, starting with Brother Fercasi, I don't know where he is or maybe not. Oh, right behind me. Perfect. Um, oh, perfect. Okay. Y'all got me spinning Mike like switch. the top. <laughs> Amen. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. I don't mean that just as a greeting, but I really mean praise the Lord. Thank you for his kindness, his grace, his presence today. And for bringing uh, Dr. Littles, thank you for responding to the Holy Spirit and uh, coming here because he has been a godsend. Um, and I'll, just two briefly things that have happened since uh, talking yesterday. I really have started to embrace this concept of it's not me, it's we. And I know that's like kind of social, like Instagram, like post that and you get a bunch of likes. But it really is, who struggles on Sunday mornings like me? who all of a sudden feels all these feelings that come up, and you're like, where the heck did this come from? I made the connection this morning. I'm feeling what my brothers and my sisters are feeling, and I'm not supposed to get frustrated or at whomever bug me or whatever, but I'm supposed to pray that God will move through that, and we will become a body that we work through that. So that's huge for me. It's really a change of mindset from, you know, a, a soul winner or a persuasive person out in the community to a disciple. So when, when I went to the grocery store this morning, I went there with a disciple mindset. I was, I went in there, not like I got to give a Bible study to someone, but I am representing Jesus. I am a disciple. And if I make disciples, I'm successful. If I'm faithful to who I'm called to be as a disciple in the grocery store, at home with my kids, with my wife, I am successful in God's eyes. And that way we're free. We're not under this big, heavy load of you must go win souls, or you must go do this, but it's, I am faithful to my identity as his disciple. So that's just some things I got of it, out of it that are really freeing my life up. So amen. God bless you. This is Lexi. Amen. I love you guys. Everyone here, um, something that I got, well, first, I just felt like, like a, I don't know, like a relief, and kind of like what Brother Uriah was saying is that it simplifies, and it's not simplistic, like, oh, it's easy to do, but it's, this is what you want me to do, God. And success is not my goal, that I really want to please God above anything. I want to do what God wants me to do, and God will give me the power to do it. And um, whether it's to love, to die out, all those things, like it's taking that, like, like my strength is sufficient for today. And I guess I want to encourage you, too, that God hears your prayers. Um, 
even before Sister Cobb mentioned it, in, um, in the summertime when she came, I had been studying uh, El Roy. I actually asked Sotia how to pronounce it. She said Roy E, so I don't know. Um, but it's the God who sees me, and I prayed, and I was like, God, what does this really look like? Because Pastor did a series on um, his yoke is easy um, and his burden is light. And I, t you know, sitting next to me, and I'm like, this feels hard, God. Like, it feels difficult living for you. And I said, God, what does this look like? And I was like, what does normal look like living for you? So then even today, God really does see and he does hear your prayers. And God wants you to live in him. And he wants you to be successful and he, in him, not success like money-wise and things like that, but really to just be fulfilled in the destiny and purpose God has you here for, whether it's something you think is small, but it's great. And I just felt, <sighs> that's how I felt. If I could, I don't know, it's no words, but that's just how I felt like a relief. And I'm just so grateful and thankful because that changes an entire generation that we're, that when those little girls, when I talk to them, is they're going to have that. They're not going to have that same pressure we've carried for years, but they get to start off knowing that just being faithful to the things of God is all they need to do in this lifetime. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Anybody feel like Dr. Littles has been a blessing to be here with us? That um, teaching very, very, uh, you want me to switch the mics? Perfect. Thanks. I'm learning uh, sound sign language. How many of you guys have been enjoying KCC? Man, you know what? The crowd looks a lot better when you smile. I'll get you there. But um, how many people are enjoying KCC? I appreciate it. I love it. And, and not only from uh, the facilitators, but, again, I don't know. I'm just a uh, we are better together kind of person. So I appreciate just hearing from the different people in the group and just hearing people's uh, different perspective, and it's been very, very helpful. So I'm going to bring up uh, Sister Newberg. She's going to come and just talk a little bit. Her KCC experience. Uh. So, um, God bless you all. Um, I'm going to be really honest, and I apologize if I'm a little too honest. I am not so easily impressed by things that are happening all the time. If there's a new class, if there's something to go, I am just not completely impressed. Usually it's kind of like, oh, dear God. But I will go. I will be consistent. But I'm not like, you know, like I'm going to sit through this and, you know, and it's sometimes to me it's like, oh, yeah, I've heard this, blah, 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 blah. But I will say this um, because I love pastors teaching. and But sometimes in my mind I'm always like, you know, it's just, but then we just sit here and we're just like being poured at and poured at. And it's just like that's not enough for me. But I won't say anything. You didn't hear this from me. So... On Wednesday nights when Pastor was doing these KCC classes, I was not really thrilled. I was like, oh, dear God, what is this going to be like? And um, I went back there and I thought, oh, all these tables are all close together. I can't hear my, like, I can't pay attention. I can't focus. And then he went to upstairs and I was like, oh, dear God, I got to do stairs. But I w I'm just being honest with you. I was like that. That was me. But I will say this. KCC classes have been incredibly amazing for me. It's, it's such an eye-opener. Um, it, it gives me things that I can take back and, I, and I, can, I, get, I can give feedback. And I become a blubbering idiot. Can I say that word over here? I become a blubbering idiot in the classrooms. And I'm just like cry and I don't like crying. But it pulls something deep from inside of me that I didn't know I had. And so sometimes, you know, um, I took back when Dr. Little yesterday had stated something about, um, he had stated about uh, discipleship and actually walking with God. And it was really profound for me because it brought something back from KCC. He had said that, you know, he had spoken to, was it Moses or was it Solomon? I thought it was Solomon. Only twice in 40 years? Solomon, that's what I thought. And so then he said that basically pretty much what I got out of it was you should be continuing to do what you do no matter you, how many times you think God should be speaking to you. And then it brought back to me like, wow, I should be walking this, walking this, walking this. And Pastor had said something in KCC class not that long ago talking about taking 
the little moments and taking those opportunities. Well, this is not just a tiny moment on KCC Wednesday nights. I'm going to tell you something. This is like an incredible moment. You will be blessed and honored to go. I encourage everybody because for me, you know, I'm just like me. Like, you know, pastor knows me. I'm not that, but this is amazing. So, and of course, I could go on and on and on, but Brother Dyson, you got to save me from keeping on talking here. All right, God bless you guys. <laughs> if you would have saw your faces when she started out, you would really, really laugh. You were like, you couldn't stop clutching your seats. I, I, I don't know what's going on. So it was, I don't know what's going on. So, um, yeah, it was just so funny seeing you guys. And once we got to the end, you were able to exhale. So uh, that was beautiful. <laughs> that was beautiful. Mo Rogers, come on up and tell them why they need to come to Friday nights, uh, your book club. Well, praise the Lord. Um, the sister, Sister Cobb uh, suggested a book. And I bought the book immediately as soon as she said it. And I started reading it, and I read it to the fifth chapter, so I'm almost halfway done, so I'm kind of mad about that. But I, I get to go back, and I get to savor it. That's what I do. I speed read, then I go back, and I savor it, okay? So now I want to savor it with some of you. So we're going to be meeting at Emily's house at 6.30 on Fridays, and I'm thinking every other Friday would be fine. And she lives at 5647 North Argyle, Argyle Avenue in Glendale, um, and her telephone number, just in case you want to check or ask more questions, 414-524-9503. The book is, what? Okay, the book is, I just forgot the book, um, Breaking Intimidation, and that's so incredibly by John Bevere. Um, and it's so important because when I moved here 33 years ago, um, my husband was out preaching. I didn't know anybody. Um, I have no family here. I have nothing here. Uh, I was alone. And God woke me up, and he said he was going to teach me how to get rid of the fear of man and the fear of Satan. And in, in that, he told me, he said, the principalities over the city know your name, and they're afraid of you. And he showed me. A multicultural, like just, it wasn't a church. It was just a line of people, all different races, and they were stepping forward, and they were taking ground in Milwaukee, and they were just basically winning, winning people, winning people, winning people, left and right. This is like the second chapter of that. It's teaching us how to stand in our rightful authority for God and not give it up to Satan so he can use your authority against you. So it's going to be a powerful encounter. Um, I just bought the workbook, uh, so it should, be, it should be exciting. So if you want to come, um, male, female, because some males ask to come, so fine. It's not a ladies' meeting. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, just real quick, uh, we're going to have some uh, special services coming up uh, December, um, uh, through the month of December. And uh, you'll have some of the ministry team here uh, ministering in those service uh, starting December 12th. Uh, this theme for this service on December 12th is uh, when, uh, when love and evil both have manifested uh, in the flesh. And then uh, December 19th is uh, going to be um, Emmanuel um, is with us. And then uh, December uh, 26 is uh, his kingdom come. So uh, make sure you're uh, looking out for those uh, different services, and God will be blessed. Everybody say God bless uh, Brother Landry. Thanks, Pastor Dyson. Really quick here because I want to hear Dr. Little speak. Um, how, many, how many in the house today are farmers? By the raising of your hand, how many farmers? We got a couple. All right, let me change the question. How many are disciples? Disciples, there we go, there we go. So this is this is principle, this concept of God I want to talk about today, real quick. And I'm I'm doing offering, so get prepared. In uh, Second Corinthians nine and uh, chapter nine, verse six, it says, "Remember this: whosoever sparingly will also who sorry whosoever whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generally 
will also reap generously. Each of you shall give what you have decided in your heart. So I'm going to stop right there real quick. So I underlined this word, whoever, because this principle does not apply to the people in the church. It says whosoever. So if we get this principle that God shares in the Bible, a lot of times we look out in the world and we're like, man, such and such is blessed. Such and such has this. They're not even in the church. They're not even living for God. But this is a principle that we need to get as the saints about sowing, right? So everybody say seed. Everybody say sow. sow. Say time, time. Work, work, and harvest. harvest. Seed, sow, time, work, and harvest. You can do two things with your seed. You can eat it and have in, instantaneous, you can, you can get full by eating it right away, right? You can eat the seed or you can sow it. So the sowing of the seed, you sow it into the ground, correct? Then you have this process of time. Time, this process is the, well, let me say this. Research, research says that if you talk to a plant, that it will actually grow faster, right? Now, I want you all to get this because I'm talking about discipleship. I got this. I, I listened to this message, but after hearing Dr. Little's uh, message about discipleship, I got this little thing on a seed, and I brought it together. So the sowing of the seed into the ground is us when we go out every day, we sow seeds into people, right? We sow seeds into people. This is discipleship. We're sowing, right? But then there's this process of time that has to happen where we allow ourselves to talk to that person, build relationship with that person, right, so that they can continue to grow faster. If you think you're going to sow a seed and you're going to leave that person alone and they're just going to grow on their own, even after baptism, even after being filled, it's probably not going to happen. So then you have this time of work, and this is the part where I myself struggle because I've, I've sown the seed, I gave them what they need, right, and I gave them a little bit of time but the work behind it, taking them out to eat. Like Dr. Lewis said, being involved with that, that airplane that they, they want to drive, trying to figure out what they like, trying to commune with them is the, the work. It's the watering. Every day you have to go out there and water that seed or else it won't grow. And then you have the harvest, which is the fruit. When you start to see that person after your disciple, you start to see the growth in them. You start to see them used in ministry and all those things. This, this, is, this applies in the discipling, in the natural, the spiritual, as well as it does in the natural. So you have the sowing of the seed. You can, you can do certain things. A lot of us think that it's the only thing that's referring to is money. But you can sow your time to VCA and POW when you don't have money. You can, sow your, you can sow honor to the man of God, to the people around you. You can sow kindness, loving. You can sow love. You can sow, and you can also sow money. And the one thing that I like is that when I get to come to the house of God, I get to sow a seed of worship. That worship will continue to live throughout my day, throughout my life. So I want everybody to sing. And I want, you, I want to leave you with this. In Ecclesiastes 11 and 6, it says, plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. So plant your seed. Keep busy. Don't plant one seed, but plant another seed. Plant a seed over here. Why? For you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. So, consecutive sowing produces consecutive harvest. If you continually sow seeds, there's no farmer that I know that sows one seed and that's it. They continually sow. They continually sow. And some people in the world that we see that have certain things or certain way of life or certain living, and we heard from Dr. Little that we have certain places we're supposed to be in, but this sowing's concept is for everybody. It's for everybody. And at this time, I just really felt led. Pastor didn't ask me to do this, but I want to allow everyone here the opportunity to sow a seed to the man of God. Dr. Little has poured himself out to us yesterday, today. I mean, I think he even stayed past the time he was asked to stay yesterday just so that he can hear what we were talking about. So I want to give you an opportunity to sow a seed. Now, you have to understand something. When you sow seed, it takes time to reap 
a harvest. This is not instantaneous. This is not sowing a seed and and you put it in a microwave and it's going to grow. It's going to take time. You're going to have to work. You're going to have to sow some things, some some more time. You're going to have to sow multiple seeds. But I want to give everybody here the opportunity to sow seed today. And and we're going to start with Pastor. He's going to give $100. My wife and I are going to give $100. Sister Rogers, $100. Sister Lori, $100 or unspoken. Amen. Anybody else? Elijah, five. Uh, Sister Asia, 100. Martine, huh? 40. A few more seconds, sis. Holtz, 30. 100. 1,000. Or 50. (laughs) Brother Ryan, 100. Sister Yesenia, the cousin, 25. Brother Dyson, 100. Now, let me tell you something. Oh, Brother Cliff, 100. Uriah, 100. Unspoken. Here we go. Marquise, just yell them out. Come on. 100. All right. Keep it going. Put them down on y'all list. Brother Cruz, 50. 50. It is the content of your heart in which you sow. If you're sowing today, it is the content of your heart, where your heart is what the reason that you're sowing. Here we go. Amen. Let's everybody stand. Let's everybody stand. Let's pray. I want the ushers to come. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for what you have placed in us, Lord God. We thank you for what you allowed the man of God to sow into this house, Lord, over the last few days. Lord, we ask, Lord, that as We are soaping and sopping up, Lord, what he has sown unto us, Lord, that you teach and help us to water, Lord, to apply the principles that we've learned, Lord God, to apply the things, Lord God, to the house of God, to those people that we come in contact with, Lord God. Help us to be true disciples, Lord God. Help us to live a normal life, Lord, according to your word. Lord, we just thank you. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. I ask, Lord, that everyone that sows here on today, Lord God, that you give them the patience of time, Lord God, that you give them the ability to work, Lord, at what they have sowed, Lord God. You give them the ability to water, Lord God, that seed that they have sowed, Lord God. We understand that it's going to take time, Lord God, but give us the patience, Lord God, to take that time out, Lord God, to continue to water, continue to work. Oh, hallelujah, we thank and we praise you. We bless your name, Lord God, before you, because you are so good. You're so worthy to be praised. And at this time, I want you to come giving. At this time, I also want to dismiss J. Crew at this time as well. And J. Crew is on the second floor today. Amen. Come giving with joy. Yes. Amen. Everybody say, God bless Pastor Rogers. Want to congratulate again, Sister Gonzalez baptized in Jesus' name last Sunday. Now remember, she needs discipleship, so take it easy on her. Be patient with her. We want to welcome those who are online for Dr. James Little Jr. to be joining us. There is a prophetic mantle on his ministry, and I I feel for prayer to be effective, we must have this balance. We must have this balance, uh, holistic diet he's been offering. And he made a statement yesterday in our session that when, when nations are fighting, to get the if, uh, issues off themselves, they go pick a fight with another country. Or they'll create political fighting externally so they don't have to deal with the internal. And how that is the case spiritually many times in a local church where we look at other issues struggling to look at our own. And I, I, I thought that was a profound statement because I, I, I travel quite a bit and I, I see this happening all the time. It's possible to hide in the church without dealing with the issues in my life as long as I stay busy, as long as I stay, you know, especially if I pray all the things on the list. I, it looks makes me look very spiritual and concerned. And we need to have a list at times. But 
this ministry, I believe God is raising up. And I'm asking that you would keep this man on your list, him and his family, that God would open new doors uh, to the hungry. There are people that are very, very hungry for uh, a need of this kind of ministry. And thank you for your hunger, the way you've received him. Um, it's a lonely road when you're in the wrong church, and there are times that you may have to minister that way. But you, you've been very open to this, and I, I'm, I want to thank you for your receptivity, your honoring of your pastor, and then you, your receptivity to the man of God saying he's, he can say some of the toughest things in the nicest way. And, uh, and that, that takes gifting. But if there's ever a time we need this kind of ministry to challenge the ministry of reconciliation, forgiveness, uh, uh, it is now. And uh, I, I believe that you all are some of the seeds of that. So what you have sold in time and offering, you're going to get a whole lot more back than what he gave you. That's the nature of seeds, isn't it? One seed produces so much more. And so you are organic. Thank you so much. Uh, for your sacrifice. Son, you've been here since 1230. Thank you so much. Uh, he will be leaving right after this service to administer Brother Hanthorns uh, this evening. So uh, you need to get all that you can get. This will be his last service with us here. And I'd like Dr. James Little Jr. to come. And would you give him your let him, would you give him permission to take his liberty as the five-fold ministry as authority in this pulpit? Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Lord, we thank you for your abundant goodness this day. The shining of the sun, the watering of the grass. We thank you for the food that you've given us. We thank you for protection from the shelter, from the coming winter. All the ways that you provide your abundant goodness, you are so good to us. And we give you glory and honor and thanks in these things. For you are worthy to be exalted and worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be reading from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Anybody ready for Christmas? Anybody looking forward to Christmas? All right. I was going to ask one of the little kids what they were looking forward to for Christmas, and then all the little kids left me. So I, uh, I guess I won't be able to do that. One of these ladies over here wouldn't enjoy me calling them a little kid. One of these fine young ladies, what are you looking forward to about Christmas? The dinner. Ooh, Christmas dinner. What, what, what do you enjoy at Christmas dinner? Tamales. Mm -hmm. Tamales. That. What are you looking for about Christmas? Brownies. Brownies. All right, we've got the food crew over here. Uh, seeing my grandma. Ah, seeing grandma. So many cool things about Christmas. I'm a Christmas fiend myself. Of course, I have problems not letting uh, grandchildren or my wife open the gifts in advance. You know, it's kind of hard to put the brakes on because I see the joy uh, that are in folks' faces. So this is the season of Christmas, and I want to preach a little bit about Christmas today from uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. I'm going to preach today that peace is the golden gift. Peace is that golden gift. You and I, this Christmas season, if we anticipate the coming of Christ, we have a golden gift, the golden gift of peace. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's the role of John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you will seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he gets here? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. 
And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in or of righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord and as in the days of old and as in the former years. Lord, we thank you for your abundant gifts at Christmas. We receive all these good gifts from you, O Lord. And this day we present ourselves to you as Christmas offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. That golden gift, half of Half of the fun of special events are, is the anticipation for it, uh, planning ahead of time for a vacation. Sometimes vacations don't actually live up to the planning anticipation. Have you ever had one of those? You really look forward to a special place, and you prepare for that, and you plot your path, and you look at pictures of it, and you anticipate the times of what it might be. My children and I, when we were growing up in Sherry, we would go camping, and in those days couldn't afford a camper, so we would have a tent. And I remember one year when we went camping, we camped at two different campgrounds, and we got rained out in both places. We had been looking forward to it for so long, and then one place ran, rained out, so we had to go to the laundromat and get sleeping bags dried and clothes dried, everything had to dry out. We Went to another location and then camped there with our parents and uh, a couple of my brothers and by a stream. And in the middle of the night, about 2 in the morning, the uh, uh, conservation officers came through the campground blowing the whistles and said, you got to go. It's rained so much that the water is rising. Sure enough, uh, well, the princess and I, at this time, we had graduated into air mattresses. Uh, <laughs> Because of the condition of the ground in our back always didn't match up. So, but uh, I put my foot down into water because my air mattress was floating on the ground. So we had to pick up everything and throw it in the back of the truck and get out as the water was rising. That camping trip is more about the planning and now the story about getting rained out than was actually there. But the planning ahead of time, I have a granddaughter that my daughter can't tell her too far in advance when they're coming to visit us because she will drive our daughter absolutely nuts. Uh, maybe a week ahead of time, and then on the calendar, they'll circle the date that they're leaving, and each day there will be the ceremonial crossing off of the day. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. We're almost there. Two more days. Two more sleeps, and once those two sleeps are over, we get to go. And, of course, they're looking forward to seeing Nana, not Papa as much, I am sure. But the anticipation of getting the guest room ready. When anybody comes to our home, there has to be the purging of the house. Got a witness in the house right there. When a guest is coming, there's the purging of the house. Everything has to be clean and I've lived here. How come it couldn't be clean when I'm living here? <laughs> but when the guest is coming, there's this anticipation and with joy, some, some tasks get done and the honey-do list gets crossed off because so-and-so is coming to visit. Israel, for years, had been looking forward to a Messiah's coming. Oh, can you imagine what it's going to be like when Messiah gets here? Passover reminded them of what God had done to bring them out of Egypt land, and, and that was cool. But you know what's going to really be cool? Messiah's coming. Messiah's going to get here. So Malachi begins to tell them that the long-awaited period is going to come to an end. Messiah is going to get here. Messiah is the Hebrew term for the Christ. Messiah is going to get here. These folks, they had returned from Babylon, captivity, back to the promised land, but it had not been easy. You know, sometimes we receive God's promises and the journey there is so challenging, we say, well, maybe we just won't make the trip. 
And that's what happened for Israel. A significant number of the people didn't go back to Jerusalem. They stayed in Babylon. Remember Mordecai and his cousin? They, they stayed in Mordecai. It's easier to stay there than it was to go back to the promise. Here we've got houses, here we've got jobs, and, and we're used to this place. If we go back home, we're going to go to an empty city. The walls are destroyed, the temple's gone. There's no infrastructure there. We would call that today, we would call that a failed state status. If you have anything of value, the robbers will come and take it away. But some courageous people made the trip. About three different waves of people had gone back. And the challenge to rebuild, rebuild homes and rebuild the temple. And with Nehemiah, rebuilding the wall. They had done all of this hard work. And for a while, they said, we don't think it's worth it. If you look down to verse number 13, you can see this attitude that they have of, God's not been so good. Your words have been stout against me, says the Lord. In other words, you're accusing me. Here's your accusation. You say, how have we spoken so much against you? And the Lord says, you have said, it is vain to serve God. It's just not Worth it. Not worth it to bring sacrifices. It's not worth it to pray. It's not worth it to worship. It's not worth it to have the festivals. What profit is it to keep your ordinances, your laws, that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now you call the proud happy. You call the people who are not being faithful, you call them happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. You're looking around and you're evaluating the wrong things. And maybe this assessment of life that it's not worth it serving Jesus. Has anyone ever had the enemy tell you that? Have you had family tell you that? Why do you keep serving Jesus? What do you get out of it? Cost-benefit analysis thing goes on. They learned it in some economics class someplace. Dollar in should get X value out. And they're asking you, if God is so good, then why are you going through rough times? You remember Job's wife? Job, who was perfect and upright before God. Now there's an assessment from God. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely upright before God. And God allows the enemy to take away his resources and to take away his children. And his wife says, you know, all those boils on you, you're not looking so hunk-like anymore. I married you because you were hunkish. And besides that, you had a fat wallet and lots of servants. Now all of that's gone. So here's an idea. Why don't you just curse God? You're going to die anyway. You might as well get even with God by cursing Him first. Now, now that, 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 that should be a warning. Someone says, I'm going to get even with God. I've seen people do that. I've served God for a year or five years, and God hasn't done what I wanted Him to. So I'm just going to go out, and I'm going to sin it up. I've been good. I've been storing up all the nastiness. So I'm going to go shoot it up, drink it up, carouse it up. I'm going to go rough it up and the list of things. I've been keeping track of all the stuff I have not done because I'm serving God and God's not kept His end of the deal. So I'm just going to leave here. I'm going to get even with God. Let me tell you, when you pick a battle with God, I know who's going to lose. Job fortunately told his wife that that was not a wise choice. And though he slay me, I will trust in him. If you look to chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, you can see how far their worship had fallen. You offer polluted bread upon my altar. The table of showbread had mold on it. Here's some stuff I'll give God. The bread that I didn't eat last week and the kids are tired of and I... 
pinched off a little bit of mold so my husband could eat one slice, but he's not even going to eat this crusty stuff anymore. I'll just go put that on the table of showbread. And you say, wherein have we polluted you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, isn't it evil? They went out into the pasture and found a lamb whose eye was running with blindness. It was lame and was just crippled, and they're going to have to put it down anyway. Well, since we've got to put down this crippled lamb, we might as well give it to God. You see how far they had fallen? He said, how about taking that to your governor? What do you think his response is going to be? Will he be pleased with you or accept your person, says the Lord of hosts? This is how far they had fallen while waiting for the promised child of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You have heard the verse many times before, and they delighted in telling it. Isaiah had said, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So here they would bring their moldy bread and their crippled caps while still anticipating with a piece of their heart that someday Messiah would come. Malachi could see their false worship. You see, not all worship is true. He said with a smile. Sometimes we worship in ways which are false. Sometimes we keep the ritual but suck the life out of it. When we worship here without actions at home to back it up, we've sucked the life out of worship. You see, serving Jesus is not a Sunday gig. Serving Jesus is more of a Monday gig and a Tuesday gig and a Wednesday gig. You know, we worship on Sunday, which is day one, not day seven. Israel worshiped on day seven, looking backward to what God had done. The church worships on day one, looking forward to what God is going to do. When you worship this morning, you're saying, I'm going to get up on Monday. Nobody's going to be there to worship with me, but I'm going to worship Him. When I'm making my first cup of coffee. Now, nobody in here would dare drink that instant stuff, right? Dear God, no. While you're waiting for the water to heat up, when you're putting your toast in the toaster or getting your Wheaties out of the closet, you're going to do so in a way that says, I'm eating this meal because I got a day to be faithful to an almighty God. This breakfast is the beginning of a wonderful day. And even though you might be one of those grumpy waker-uppers, there's some looking around the house right now. <laughs> Evidently, a few of you know who those grumpy waker-uppers are. Even if you're a slow to wake up, as you're getting your coffee and your Wheaties, you're saying, oh, Lord, I worshiped you on Sunday with my brothers and sisters. I worshiped you on Sunday saying Monday belongs to you, and Tuesday I'm going to anticipate your goodness, and on Wednesday I'm going to rise in the morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, and I shall be glad in it. Even if I get a pink slip on Thursday. Well, they used to be pink slips, now they're emails. Used to, they at least write it down on a piece of paper and give it to you that you're laid off. Now they just send you an email. I have no idea why companies like to lay people off at Christmas time. But it seems like the, the downsizing, or here's a fancy word, the re, where you don't have a job because we restructured. That's just, you fired me. Just, just, just put it in plain word. You fired me. We worship today even though some of you may get a restructuring on Thursday. 
You know why we worship on Sunday? Because we say it doesn't matter what comes my day this week. This week belongs to the Lord. And the next week belongs to the Lord. He is ever faithful and wherever he takes me, he is always good to me. Malachi had a grasp of that and he was trying to tell Israel in a prophetic way. He knew why this was covenant God. You can see it in verse number 11 of chapter number 1. Malachi had a vision beyond today. Worshippers get a vision beyond today. This is why don't we don't just worship him for what he has done. We worship him with a vision of what God is doing in our world today. Malachi had a vision. He was a prophet. He was a seer. He could see beyond what was going for the moment. And he says, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place incense shall be offered unto my name. And a pure offering, not this moldy bread stuff. Not this crippled cow stuff. But a pure offering is going to be brought from among the Gentiles. For my name shall be great among the heathen, says the Lord of hosts. Brothers and sisters, Christmas is a coming. We're going to get some brownies. We're going to get to go visit Grandma. We're going to enjoy some presents under the tree. Do we have any present shakers in the house? You get the gift out from under the tree and you kind of shake it a little bit. And We have a tradition in our family that every once in a while you have a gift that it has do not shake right under the name. Because we don't want it shake until it's broken. But if it's no refrain from shaking tag, it's legal to pick it up and shake it and move it around. And every once in a while, there's even an oops where your fingernail goes through the wrapping paper. I don't know how that happens. Now, it's not legal to tear it open, but it is legal to peek as far as that hole is. Peering in cause Christmas. Christmas is coming and the anticipation that is there. Malachi was telling Israel, don't forget Messiah is coming. The messenger of God is coming. His covenant is, comes from God and did not come from us. He's not only going to bless us, but finally the promise to our great, great granddaddy, Abraham, is going to be met. Through you, every family of the earth is going to be blessed. And I'm going to bless you so you can bless everybody else. Christmas is coming. The Messiah is on its way. Tree, anybody have a Christmas tree up? We got one up. Princess just put it up for a left and she put the lights on it. She sent me a picture while I was at the Dallas airport with this year it's a fresh tree Christmas. Every once in a while, most Christmases are the fake tree Christmas. Why? Because I'm a tightwad. We can put the fake tree in the shed and pull it out. But every once in a while, the princess says, this is a year for a fresh tree. So this year is a real tree, and it's in the house, and it's smelling up the house. But real trees need different kinds of ornaments. You know that silver stuff that they used to put on trees? Well, it's one of those years where we got that silver stuff hanging off the tree. And then she said, why don't you just take the picture and blow it up a little bit, look a little closer, because you'll find your mama's porcelain bells. They were antique when my mama got them in 1966. I don't know how old they are, but there's something about seeing those little porcelain bells that are a reminder of my mama and all the Christmases that I had with my mama. So the princess sent me a picture. The tree's up. The glitter's on it. Your mama's bell is hung carefully. Look closer, you old man, and even you can see them on the tree. Christmas is on its way. I believe as the church looks forward to Christmas, we need to come prepared. Now, maybe you're one that likes to go to the tree lot 
the day before Christmas to see if Charlie Brown's tree is still left. Maybe you're a tightwad like me and says, I want a real tree, but I want the last tree and maybe it's cheaper. So maybe your preparation is just the night before. That's all right. Just make sure you're prepared for Christmas morning. If we do that in the natural, how much more so we should be doing in the spiritual. So as we look forward to Christmas, as you're listening to your Christmas music, as you're wrapping the gifts, as you're smelling up the house, baking brownies, of course, we have a rule at my house, since I paid for the dough, I get to eat it as it goes. <laughs> right? This is just the law at the house. You don't like the law, there's other houses in town. <laughs> but the law is, and since I like cookie dough as much as I like, anybody else, cookie dough eater? The princess knows as she's making the cookies, there's going to come a spoon snaking around her hand and diving into the mixing bowl. Why? I called it my house and I paid for it. <laughs> Get used to it. And now that it's been 41 years, she's gotten used to the spoon snaking around and eating of the dough because it's, it's Christmas. <laughs> if we do that in the natural, how much more should we should do so in the spiritual? If we look, however, back to our text in verse number 2, Malachi has said, Messiah's coming, put the party on. But then verse number two, he says, but who, who's going to be able to stand when he gets here? This Messiah with authority from Yahweh God is coming to our house, coming to our neighborhood, coming into our world. And we've anticipated, but I have a question for you. When he gets here, who can stand in front of him? You've been waiting for generations. Your grannies and your great-grannies and your great-great-grandpas have told the story. The Messiah is coming. Even before Abraham's promise, it was a promise to our great-great-great-great-granny Eve that there will come a day, one who's born, who will be able to step on the head of the serpent. But the question is, what's going to happen when he gets here? Because when he gets here, he's going to be like a refining fire. Because this Messiah that you think is just a party guy is also a clean up the mess guy. As a matter of fact, that's why he's coming. Cleaning up the mess. Getting everything straightened out. Now the problem that most of us has is we always blame somebody else for the mess. We always point the finger if the governor would get it fixed and if the town council would get it fixed and if those people across town of the other political party, if they would get it fixed, if my next door neighbor would cut the grass or plant grass, whatever it is, if they would get it fixed, then my property values would go up. It's always somebody else. Matter of fact, when I don't clean up my own room, it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> I'd do it if you wouldn't hound me. I was getting ready to fix that, but you told me to do it again, and I'm just going to wait a little while. It's your fault. As human beings, we're so quick to see it's someone else, and here the Messiah, the Christ, is coming, and this Christmas as we get ready to receive our Christmas gift from Jesus. Now, of course, we give him gifts, but here's the Christmas gift he is giving us, particularly in 2021 Christmas. He's giving us the golden gift of peace. The golden gift of peace. I don't know what's on your Christmas wish list. Maybe in your early onset geezerhood like mine, it's pretty hard to come up with something that you really want because I got plenty of food. I got extra pairs of shoes. I have a whole drawer full of bow ties. When I go places, I just pull out the drawer and grab a handful, throw them in the bag, and go on my way. I got enough shirts. 
I wish I didn't push the buttons out so hard on a few of those shirts. They didn't used to fit that way, but I got enough stuff. This Christmas, what we need is the golden gift of peace. Our world is in violence on every side. Our world is torn economically and politically and socially. And what would happen this Christmas if peace would break out like COVID? What happened if we would walk around and breathe on everybody and the breath that would come out of us would be a contagious breath of peace? What happened if doorknobs that you touched, you left uh, the touch of peace DNA on every doorknob and every rail? What would happen is you handed somebody a cup of coffee in Jesus' name. It was a cup of coffee that had been contaminated by peace. Such a contamination of peace that grumpy people would smile. Imagine that. That as you walk by them, their grumpiness would have to be eclipsed by the peace. That's the gift Messiah wants to bring this Christmas, 2021, peace. Now as the prophet begins to talk about this call of peace, he's reminding us that the Messiah comes. When he comes, he's going to purify like gold and silver. Because as a cleansing one, as a peace-bringing one, he's going to have to change some stuff. You might remember Isaiah 6, chapter 1, uh, the, the Isaiah the prophet said, uh, Woe is me, and I am undone, when he saw the Lord's train filling the temple. Psalm chapter 15, the psalmist had asked it, and Israel had repeated it many times down through the ages, Lord... Who can abide in your tabernacle? And who will be able to climb up or go up to your holy hill? And then the psalmist answers the question, those that walk uprightly and those that work righteousness and those that speak truth in their heart, they are doers of these things and they are not doers of backbiting. They are not doers of doing evil towards their neighbor. They are not doers of not accusing or reproaching their neighbor. Instead, they give honor to those who fear the Lord, and they keep their own promises. And when they loan money, they don't ask for interest back. And they spend their energy protecting the innocent. The psalmist says these are the people that can stick close to Messiah. This Christmas, the Messiah, the Jesus is coming, but he's going to bring uh, purification on those who look for him. If you want the gift of peace this Christmas, you have to recognize that the gold that is called you has a little bit of what we might say slag in it. It's got a little bit of dross in it. It has a little bit of impurities in it. But when a gold miner finds a vein of gold in the hillside, he doesn't require that it be 24 karat gold. He says as long as there's just a little bit of gold in it, I know how to dig it out of the mountain, and I know how to take it to the fire. I'll crush it a little bit, and I'll send it into the fire, and I'll burn off and separate the impurities. And when it comes out, it will come out as pure gold. I'm wondering, brothers and sisters, if we are willing to put ourselves in the Master's hand. I'm wondering if the things which cause us to lack peace in our own spirit I'm wondering if we'll let Jesus burn that away. Pastor mentioned unrealized expectations. I'm wondering if we're willing to let Jesus burn those things away. I'm wondering if the pain that other people have caused you and I've har you and I harbor those pains in our spirit and they define us. I'm wondering if this Christmas we can bring those disappointments to the baby Jesus and say, Jesus, my gold is mixed up with some of this stuff, but there's some good inside of me, but you're going to have to burn out. You're going to burn out, have to burn out my pain. You're going to have to burn out some sorrow. You're going to have to burn out some despair. But I'm going to stick close to the fire this Christmas, Jesus, because I don't want to be separated from you. 
I've been through a season without peace. And I know this Christmas, I need the Prince of Peace more than ever before. So when I see Christmas on its way, instead of stepping away from the fire, I'm going to walk right into your purification process this Christmas. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm inviting you all this week. This week, pray for peace. I know some people say pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is a biblical call. But the prophet Jeremiah said after he told the people uh, that God, he knew God's thoughts towards them when they were good thoughts, he said, when you go someplace, pray for the peace of the city where you are. So not only should you be praying for the peace of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem needs peace, but you need this week to be praying for the peace of Milwaukee or your township where you might live. Let this be a week of prayer for peace. Dear God, this Christmas season, would you let peace run like a river through our streets? This Christmas, would you let peace be a vision that flashes on the iris of everyone's eye? Would you let peace be a dreamed possibility? Those who are in violence in their own mind as they dream in the night hour, would you let peace shatter into the dream of terror by night, that nightmare, and let it become a dream of peace, dear God? This is what you want to do on earth this Christmas. You are the Prince of Peace. Can you stand close, not stand literally right now. I'll get there in a minute. I'm almost done. There is hope. I will finish. Can we stand close enough to the manger this Christmas? Say, Lord, you came from a place where there is no violence. You came from a place where your will is done everywhere. You came from a place The gold is not the most precious thing, but the peace of your presence is the most precious thing. I'm wondering this Christmas, can we stand close to the manger and say, Jesus, I need that kind of peace in my heart. I need that kind of peace in my family. I need that kind of peace in my workplace. And dear God, my neighbor needs that kind of peace. Several years ago, I was driving through my neighborhood and I was so shocked by what I saw, I didn't know what to do. Out of the house looked like a father and son. Dad looked to be in his 50s and son looked to be in his 30s. Evidently, they had such an argument inside, and I don't know what they had wrecked inside, but their fight, their fisticuffs spilled out into the yard. I didn't know what to do. The only thing I knew to do was, Lord, you know what caused that kind of pain. Would you find a way to bring peace to their house? I'm wondering, those of you who worshipped on this Sunday morning, I'm wondering if you can worship tomorrow in a faithful way that says, Lord, I know that my own life is not pure gold. Would you purify me so I can be at peace with you, so I can pray peace into Milwaukee? To know that Milwaukee could have peace makes it incumbent on us to draw closer to Jesus this Christmas and allow him to burn away every impurity that impedes our peace with him. You see, the greatest challenge of peace isn't between nations. Greatest challenge of peace isn't in a family. Greatest challenge of peace isn't one uh, 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 corporation trying to win the market share of another corporation. The greatest obstacle to peace is our relationship with an almighty God. For brothers and sisters, when you're at peace with Jesus, everything else, everything else falls into second place. If you're at peace with Jesus, you can make it through fiery trials and difficult places because you know your Redeemer ever lives and you know that you are on His mind and you know He holds you in His hand and He's overjoyed with you if peace comes our way this Christmas. So I'm here to tell you this morning, Christmas is a coming. Whether your Christmas tree is up or not, Christmas is still coming. Maybe you're like me and haven't found that stocking gift for your princess. I got some work to do when I get home. 
I'm not going to tell you what it is just in case she tunes in and watches us later. I got some more work to do, but I got a few more days till Christmas. I got a friend, Brother Jimmy, who lives in St. Louis, and he's such a giver, always giving. Brother Jimmy, I just sent him a birthday present last week, and now Christmas is coming up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him a leather bag for him to carry his gift to people at church so that every time he goes to church taking one of his gifts to somebody, he's going to have to remember me, his, other, his friend Jim, and I'm going to go with him every time he blesses somebody. i got a little bit of work to do before Christmas. I've got a brother-in-law. I think I'm going to make him a leather portfolio so he can put his Bible and his notes in there. And Every time he goes to worship, I'm going to go to worship with him. i got a, some work to do this Christmas. i got a few Bible rebinds, I promised. But here's what I really need to do. I need to put my eye towards here comes Jesus. And although my immediate response is to pull back, my immediate response is to draw back, just like uh, one of those Hallmark Christmas movies. Is anybody in the house will confess that they've seen one? <laughs> if you've watched a Hallmark Christmas movie, you know that in the middle of it, when it looks like the two of them are going to get together. <laughs> the script says that a problem is going to come up. And true love is going to evaporate right on the screen in front of you. But you know that that conflict is going to be resolved. And at the end, they're going to kiss and the snow is going to fall. You see, for purposes of research, I've watched a few. <laughs> Malachi was saying, Messiah's coming, but there's a twist in the story. You think he's coming and going to fix everything. Here's the twist in the story. He's going to start with you. Here's the twist in the story. Everybody's going to be at peace. Peace on earth. Isn't that what the angels proclaimed? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. If you fast forward from Luke 2 towards the end of Luke, when Jesus was on that white donkey riding into Jerusalem, the crowd sang out, peace in heaven. They were not willing to hear the angels cry that says, he wants to bring peace to your town. He wants to bring peace to your hut. He wants to bring peace to your street. He wants to bring peace to your violence. The crowd instead said, we think he'll have peace in heaven. We think there will be peace when this is all done. Brothers and sisters, don't listen to the crowd. Listen to the angel. The angel says, this Christmas is a Christmas for your peace. But here's the twist in the story. The peace starts with me and the peace starts with me with you. If we would all place ourselves in the purifying fire with gold being brought forward and impurities being uh, left out, we can see the wonderful things that are going to happen. Verse number three, we see he shall sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver, will purify the sons of Levi and purge as gold and silver offer unto the Lord. They will offer unto the Lord an offering and righteousness. Restoration would take them back to a season, verse number four. Then they will bring offerings of Judah and Jerusalem that will be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. They were, the prophet was saying, remember Mount Sinai when God shook the mountain. Remember the dedication of the tabernacle or the dedication of the temple when Solomon's agenda that he had planned, the choir had practiced for seven years to get the tunes just right for dedication day. But the presence of God was so strong they had to lay down their harps and their voices froze because God's presence was so rich. Remember the time when uh, we will remember the times when Jesus had meals with others and there was an upper room experience 
and there was a Cornelius' house experience. If we remember those days, the Messiah is saying, I want your time of restoration, and I want your time of pleasant offerings to be just like that. I want this Christmas season to be just like an upper room experience when you realize that he has come with cloven tongues and a fire that sets on all of us. To purify and cleanse us and make us gold as of precious gold. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't feel very goldish. There was a thing during the Middle Ages called alchemy. The alchemist would try to take lead into gold. I don't know how many experiments they had, but so far, they have all failed. You might be saying, Brother Littles, there's not a whole lot of gold in me to be refined. And if God refined out all the junk, there might be a grain of gold left. I need you to understand that you are made in the image of an almighty God. And if you are here this morning or watching online, and this is literally the first time you've heard the story of Christmas, I need you to understand there's enough of God's image inside of you that if you will bring your life to Jesus and let him purify you this Christmas, you will be precious as gold. And the gift of gold Jesus wants to give you is the gift of peace. And in return, your life becomes a precious offering to the King of kings and Lord of lords. The wise men came from afar bringing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You might be thinking 2021 has left you empty of much worship, empty of much value. You got to see the baby Jesus first. You got to let him purify you and cleanse you, and you will realize you have much to worship him for. You have much to live for, and you have much to testify for. I may have mentioned it here last time because it weighs a little heavy on my mind, but during the Gulf War, those 20 years of the Gulf War, we lost roughly 6,500 men and women in battle. But during that time, we lost over 50,000 men and women to suicide, military men and women to suicide. As horrible as it was of fighting on the battlefield where we failed our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, as we fail to let them know that there's some peace that they could have in their heart. The greater battle was not someone putting an IED in front of them on the road and blowing them up. The greater battle to those men and women was the brokenness in their own spirit. Brothers and sisters, our world is in need of the golden gift of peace. And Jesus is that answer. This Christmas promises peace if you will let Jesus in. If you will let Jesus in, he will transform all of us into precious gold so that our worship would be in line with Romans 12, 1, as the apostle cries out to us even today, as I beseech you therefore, brethren and sistren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, and that's your reasonable service to be purified so that our gifts to him are not moldy bread. You see, if I arbor anger against you, if I arbor some kind of double lifestyle while I serve Jesus on Sunday and serve me the rest of the week, I can even give tithes of offering on Sunday, but the rest of the week all my finances is mine. I'm, I'm serving two masters. When I do that, I'm offering moldy bread. But this morning, this afternoon, we are called to draw near to Jesus. Let him purify us so that our lives offer worthy worship to him. We sang about it earlier. We prayed about it earlier. Now I'm asking you, are you ready for the golden gift this Christmas? The gift of peace. Would you stand with me now, please? When I was a child, we would sing a song from time to time that said, We are standing on holy ground. Surely there are angels all around. 
I believe right now you and I and those at home in the living room, sitting at your kitchen table, wherever you're watching, we are on holy ground right now because we dare to believe that the coming of Jesus burns away all of the waste and leaves us purified with peace. We stand on holy ground where we are willing to cry out, Abba, Father, I need you. Standing on holy ground where we are revealed as being too weak for this on our own. Where it's revealed to us the challenges beyond our imagination to solve and our strategic thinking always falls short. We are standing on holy ground where we have to say, Lord, all I can do is offer you my life. Would you purify it and cleanse it so that then I can live worshipfully for you? Lord Jesus, we are on holy ground right now. And I have to believe that in this room are also angels all around. But even more so, I'm sure of the fact that your Holy Spirit is here. Powerful way. Inviting us to step into Christmas. I'm not talking about a Hallmark movie, Jesus. I'm talking about a real Jesus this Christmas. And this can be the day as we anticipate your coming that we can step near you and let everything be purified out of us. Lord, I ask right now in your name, would you reveal contaminations in our thoughts to us? I ask you right now, would you love us enough, dear Jesus? to reveal confusion in our emotions, anger in our heart. Would you reveal that to us, Lord? Would you reveal to us where my hands haven't been filled with loving actions and my steps of grace have been unstable? Would you reveal to me a place where I can take a greater walk of grace in my world? I want you to reveal it, Lord, not to make me sick, but reveal it so I can bring that to you, the Christ child, and let your cleansing purify out all of those impurities so I am left with the gift of gold, the gift of peace with you, so that my worship is faithful and my living sacrifice every day this week be in line with your purposes and your design. In Jesus' name I pray. Jesus' name I pray. Jesus' name I pray. Jesus' name. I don't ask it without reservation, but I'm literally asking that the Lord would reveal torn thoughts in your mind. Literally asking if there's brokenness in your spirit, that you would sense it right now in a very tangible way, and that that would draw you to Jesus where He can purify you. Do you have a doubt that God is good? Do you have a doubt that he's been faithful? Do you have a doubt that he's got you in his hand? I want that to be revealed in your mind right now. And then you have the courage to bring that doubt to Jesus. He's coming. Let him purify all the doubt, all the fear, all the anger, all of the despair, all of the confusion. In Jesus' name I pray. If there's anybody in the house today that needs to take a step toward Jesus, I know I do. I need to take a step closer to Jesus. of Jesus even more. Would you come? Would you trust Jesus with your impurities? He's not going to shame you and push you away. He's not going to say you're not good enough. Instead, he invites you. Would you bring those impurities closer to me? If you will bring that impurity closer to me, then I can do something about it. 
Would you put your wound next to me, your impurity next to me? Let me cleanse it right now. I will make you as gold and silver. Just bring it to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Hallelujah. 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 If you would allow me, I'd like to do something here for a moment. You'll love me later. You may not like me for the moment. But all warfare, victories, generational challenges, they take place in the home. Your greatest act of character building is in the home. And one of the things the enemy does not want to see is the practicing, the developing of these powerful teaching principles in the home. If you're married, you have relatives. I've got Cliff as my relative. Um, I, I'd like us to get near our families for just a moment. I know that with my wife, Ryan, and Cliff, those, if you're without a family, please, you can join my family. But there are some prayers we need to pray. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's easier for me to pray by myself. But as we work through the challenge of praying together, here's my prayer. That the spirit of prayer may rest upon your apartment, your house. That there be a spirit of unity in our communication. And that we are determined to fight through every generational curse, every generational battle. And if the government was on his shoulders, then every generational God we fight is on his shoulders. In fact, it's off his shoulders because of the, the crucifixion. Sister Lori, would you take my Filipino sister and let her pray with you? I don't want anybody not being together. Again, you get the family Rogers house if you're without family here. But our prayer... Is simply, we, we, we're asking, we need, we're asking for a spirit of prayer to hit our homes. Help us as a family to draw closer together 
with Christ-centered activities in our homes, improving the communication in our home. I take authority over every electronic device that's separating us from quality time. I'm talking to myself the same. But would you dare to pray this prayer with me? Come on, would you dare to pray this prayer? We endeavor to step on every generational God that would hinder transparent communication. We come against sexual perversion. I come against the spirit of pornography. Let the spirit of prayer rest upon our homes. Let the spirit of prayer rest upon the crew's home. Give us time together, Lord. As we eat together, let us pray together. Christ-centered activities. I speak over somebody who's struggling and they're fasting right now. Lord's going to help us. That next fast is going to break something in your family. That next fast is going to break something in your home. But we bind together in the name of Jesus. Come on. We got to fight through it. I don't care what it is as couples. We got to fight through it. The next generation of our children is dependent upon us working through those misunderstandings. Those, those hard areas of confrontation and com communication. In the name of Jesus, God, you brought us this far. As for me and our house, let the atmosphere of the glory of the Lord rest upon my bedroom, my kitchen, my living room. God, we're calling on the grace of God to help us. My parents and grandparents couldn't do what I'm trying to do. But I call on grace. I call on grace, Arthur Mercedes. I call on grace, Sister Sheena. I call on grace, Brother Sister Dyson. I call on grace, Erica. He died for the home. It is the first church. He died for the home. He kededa lo bose. Mando do do lo bose kedede. Mando do do lo do ye be bose. Lando do do lo bose kedede. Be kando yo lo do do ye lo do. Si kando yo lo lo bose kando yo do do do. Mando yo so kando yo do. To do what we cannot do. Hallelujah. 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 E kando do lo do. Let there be a breathing. A breathing presence, uh, hallelujah, upon our mothers, our grandmothers, God. A breathing presence. You are our only hope. You are our only source to turn to. In the name of Jesus, we have no other place to turn to, God. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God be for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. The strength of God be upon your family. The strength of God be upon your family. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The strength of the Holy Ghost, he cannot lo, 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 yo, bo, yo. upon the home. Some of you are battling. You're not able to sleep at night. Your sleep shall be sweet. He maketh me to lie down. Run out every spirit that that's supposed to be in my home. 
In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, to be close to you. Hey, just to be close to you. Just to be close to you. I will restore the year that the canker worms and the pot worms have done to your family. And I will bring a harvest of fruit with every child in your home. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He I speak to the spirit of intimidation that would try to work against the unity of the entire family. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let it out. Come on, let it out. 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 Just let it out. Come on. Come on. We got that out. That's it. Yes, yes. We got that out. Love us. We got that out. Love us. Love us. Blood of the doorposts of your family. She can no 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 souls that need with you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The blood of the doorposts against fear, impatience, self-criticalness. God, we thank you, 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 Lord. Just to be close to you. 